Welcome to Sacred Realms. It's a great day in Hyrule, y'all. Welcome to Sacred Realms, a Zelda retrospective podcast. I'm your host, Lyndon Willoughby, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Matt Willoughby. Uh, we are back in your casa tonight, Matt. We are. It's a little change of venue. We're, uh, since we recorded last night, you decided to be gracious and not make me drive to you twice in a row. Yeah, well, I have selfish motives. You're holding a, a turtle-shaped sandbox that my <laughs> two-and-a-half-year-old really, really wants. So. Yes. I'm just going to go ahead and pick that up while I'm here. He's like, he's he's in a sandbox phase. Like, he freaking loves it. Every day he gets home from school, he's like, go outside, play sand. I'm like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. But we've just got this, like, sad little Rubbermaid container from Walmart that the sand's in right now. Um, and it's it's definitely like, you know, he doesn't know any different. But I'm trying to up the situation a little bit, you know, like the sandbox presentation has uh, has much to be desired. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And uh, you've got one just laying around. So we're going to going to pick that up. And so <sighs> it, it just made sense for me to come on down here and do this in person. Uh, and, and honestly, I always like um, I, well, I just love being in this house in general for anyone who doesn't remember last time we recorded here. Um, this was our grandparents house the whole time we were growing up. And so a lot of happy memories in this place. But. Uh, on the way down here, I was thinking back to my childhood, Matt, and you know what I remembered? Uh, tell me. I beat my first ever Zelda game for the first time in this house. No way. Yeah, I beat Link's Awakening uh, when I was like in second grade. Uh, I was staying over here for a night or two. And uh, while I was here with my Game Boy Pocket, I, I beat the game for the first time. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's really fun. I know. It gave me the warm and fuzzies. Yeah. So it was great. Um, but anyway, so uh, yeah, it's a rainy, stormy night out there. I mean, it is. It's kind of gross. And a little bit of inside baseball on the podcast. Matt and I are actually recording this episode the day after our <laughs> disastrous <laughs> episode that we recorded with Max. Hey, it was a great episode, but the process of getting it recorded was Oh, the disastrous. episode is spectacular, but like seriously, the, the technical issue issues that we ran into were were uh, second to none like we've never encountered anything like that before so um anyway it was a very late night um i was very tired this morning but you know what the show must go on we had a game to beat uh and an excellent guest to talk about it with uh we are pleased to welcome back onto the show sam aka nintendo fangirl how you doing sam good thanks for having me back of course. I mean, uh, honestly, uh, we owe you thanks, right, for being a person who has positive uh, thoughts and feelings about The Legend of Zelda spirit tracks so that we could, like, diversify our <laughs> podcast situation for this season. Well, what can I say? Easy to please when it comes to <laughs> Zelda, at least. <coughs> well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. I mean, we're Matt and I are over here like reevaluating our entire like worldview at at the moment. But uh, I'm glad you, I'm glad you're in a positive place with it, with everything. Um uh, how have you been doing? I mean, I know we were catching up a little bit before we started recording, but uh I mean, you've had some some pretty big kind of high profile stuff that has been going on um in your life since we talked last. Yeah, I mean, uh let's see. In the world of Nintendo, uh Princess Peach Showtime is coming out soon. So um, I got to do like some early demo stuff with that. Pokemon Horizons, the series just came out. So I got to do some preview stuff with that. I've been um, getting to do some fun stuff with Nintendo lately and PAX East is coming up. Nice. Yeah. And I'm actually kind of curious. So the so the Princess Peach game, um, give me the elevator pitch on what kind of game that is, because I like I saw the reveal, you know, when they when they dropped that first trailer in the Nintendo Direct. And I, I know that it, like I've known that it was going to be coming out soon and everyone's excited because like Peach finally gets like her own, you know, mainline game and all that. Um, but like what kind of game is it? It's kind of like uh, if you take. 
Let's see. Like the the genre of it is literally like variety, which doesn't make sense, but that's what it is. It's like you take maybe eight different kind of platformers, um, completely different in gameplay and throw them all into a single game and Peach gets to do it all. So it's like it's like a simple action platformer is the the easiest way to put it, but massive variety in terms of what you're actually doing in the gameplay. Huh. Okay. Interesting. I mean, did you enjoy it? Like your, your time mm-hmm, with the demo mm-hmm. and stuff? Yeah. I do think it, it plays very much like a game that's for children, um, at least what I played, which to be fair in the early game, since there are so many mechanics, all using like five buttons, mind you, but since there are so many different mechanics and different kinds of gameplay, it's kind of like it has to go through five different tutorials right, right up front. So I think yeah. that might be why it felt like the easiest game in the world, but <laughs> it does play like a game that's for children. All the same, very cute, lots of collectibles. I really enjoyed what I played. This is one of the interesting things about Nintendo to me, like a company who will tell you that they kind of see themselves as being like a, a toy, a toy company, right? Um, as opposed to just like big, serious video game developer, right? Like your Xboxes or Playstations or whatever. Um, but Uh, Because of that, right, I feel like you have a very large variety in difficulty uh, within their output of games, you know, like you've got stuff that is, you know, your Tears of the Kingdom, like uh, mechanically kind of complex, high skill ceiling, you know, combat that like will really kick your ass around the place. Um, And then you got all the way down from there into like your Kirby's, um, which are kind of like uh, platformer light a little bit you know like platformer elements but not to the same level of difficulty that you might see in like a side-scrolling mario game right um and then even further down from that you've got levels of difficulty within series you know you've got your mainline pokemon games but you've also got your let's go series of pokemon games right um which are kind of catering to a bit more of like the that younger audience you know um and so it's always interesting to me like trying to parse like why Nintendo, like how Nintendo comes to make the decisions that they do about like when to make a game a little bit higher up on that difficulty curve or a little lower. I would assume with the Princess Peach game, they're trying to cash in a lot on that uh, Mario movie audience, right? Which they know is going to skew a little younger. So that's might have something to do with it. But anyway, but that uh, it's cool. It, it's good to hear that you had a positive uh, first experience with the game, Sam. And it's one of those where it's like, it's, it's Nintendo first party. So I'm at the very least going to be paying attention uh to the reviews and like just kind of seeing how it all comes out um because uh you know even even when a nintendo first party game isn't necessarily for me uh, i still love to see it do well so definitely going to be following that cool 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 um well of course uh you know there's the wide world of nintendo right uh but then there's also (laughs) the world of uh nintendo's back catalog of games which we've been dipping into uh we finished a game today matt yeah, we uh, we definitely did, and um, it is a game. Yeah, uh, it so is a we, game of all times. Yes, I've played a lot of Spirit Tracks in the last forty eight hours. Um, I like. I, I would say I've probably spent about four and a half, five hours with Spirit Tracks over the last two days, um, and so definitely been in it. Uh, we, you know what? We cleared out the finale. We know how the game ends. We know where it's all been going and leading to. We're going to talk about all that on this episode tonight, Sam. Real quick before we get into that. Because this is your first appearance on this season of the show, we're going to do that thing where we ask you what your own personal history is with The Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks. Um, When you played it for the first time, kind of where you sort of hold it uh, against the other games in the series, like or dislike. Um, And yeah, just some of your just some of your impressions of the game. Sure. So uh, I think as we have alluded to a little earlier, um, I have a a pretty positive memory and opinion of Spirit Tracks and of both of the the DS uh, Zelda games, honestly. Um, And I played them both when they came out. So uh, the last time I fully played Spirit Tracks, I will say, was I believe in 2010, like very shortly after it came out. Okay. Um, I did pick it back up this week. So I have personally played about 15 hours of Spirit Tracks this week. Wow. Um, A pretty good chunk. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, I didn't get back to the end of the game. I didn't recomplete it. So just to like jog my memory, I watched, uh, 
uh, shout out to all of the YouTubers who upload like the no commentary videos of <laughs> video games out there. Um, I watched some, I watched like the, the last two dungeons in the finale so that I could be re-reminded of how the whole thing plays out at the end. Um, but I also did boot up my original file from way back in the day and, and was reminded that I did have the full complete gold train. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a spirit tracks loyalist to some extent. I think I was re reminded of some of the less perfect areas, <laughs> the, the needs improvement areas of the game after playing it a bunch this week especially without like, I, I don't think I have a lot of nostalgia for it because it's not like part of my childhood. I was in my uh, almost 20 when it came out. So, um, but overall I enjoyed the game and I have a lot of, of positive feelings toward it still. So when unlike you, some other people, maybe. Right. Exactly. Like, <laughs> like a few other people, not naming names here. Hmm, um, hmm, yeah. Hmm. But uh, so when you say you played about 15 hours, uh, what about yep. about which dungeon? Like what section of the game did that get you to? Uh, I got to the end of the ocean temple. OK, cool. Very cool. Um, but I was also like I needed all the bunnies. I was 100 percent in. <laughs> everything I could do. Oh to that boy! Point. Wow, that's dedication. It is. So, do you like the train, the traversal system? N- not, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's parts I like about it, and, and it might be um, the music tricking me into thinking that I like it or something like that. Mm. But the the points in time where it's not stressful, I don't mind it. Where it's kind of like I don't mind doubling back if there's no bad guys and there's no dark trains in this area. I don't mind circling to get another bunny or whatever. Um, But I'm, I'm not a fan of, of sneaking mechanics and the trains and the dark trains and the armored trains are kind of like similar to sneaking mechanics in a lot of ways. Uh So I'm not crazy about that. Yeah. And then of course, coupled with the fact that like you can't easily turn your train in the opposite direction or whatever, right. The controls Mm -hmm. kind of, it's like, doesn't give you a lot of options, but um yeah, I mean, so definitely uh, the whether or not the train is a good thing, a bad thing, or a really bad thing is one thing we've been talking about a lot this <laughs> season. And um, I think uh, we were talking with uh, Max Nichols last night who really hates the train. And I think Matt and I, you and I both still on the whole like the train more than the boat from Phantom Hourglass, right? Mm-hmm. That's where I landed, at least at the end of this whole thing. I like the music. I don't like the train. That overworld theme is really doing a lot of heavy lifting. It's, it's really <laughs> elevating. That's how good it is. It's really elevating the train experience. But if if like when I play with the volume all the way down, I think I hate it more than the okay. boat. <laughs> well, why why would you do that though? The music is so good. I, mean, you I gotta, was playing like, it in bed the other night, and I didn't want to get up and get my headphones, and like I was like, eh, whatever. I didn't. It didn't last long. I got pretty tired of it pretty fast. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Sam, I'm going to ask you the same question we've been asking everyone else for the last few weeks. When you're riding in the train and the overworld theme is bumping, are you choo chooing to the music? <laughs> Am I cho- personally choo chooing? No, you're you're well, yanking the train yeah, horn yeah, to the are music. You, are you blowing the train whistle in time with the oh, music? Oh, I thought you meant, am I like yeah. sitting <laughs> playing my DS going choo choo? No. <laughs> well, I mean, if you are, then that's also good information to have. Like. Um, yeah, you know, I think so. Probably not 100% intentionally, but. I, I like to make sure that like the chugga chugga of the train is going with the music mm-hmm. and and everything is nice and cohesive. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I was doing a lot of that today. It's a good time. It helps pass the uh, pass the minutes for sure. The 15 minutes that it takes you to get anywhere in this game. Ugh, um, so slow. Uh huh. Exactly. But uh, in, until the very, very, very end. But we're going to talk about that. Um, but cool. Uh, I mean, so. For reasons that you would say that you enjoy spirit tracks, just kind of generally speaking, um, would you like what is it about that for you? Is it gameplay? I mean, are you are you one of those people who enjoys the touch controls or not? Um, Is it story? Is it just Mm. kind of vibes? Um, I would say I would put three three different things at the top of the list. One is music. I think it's like top tier Zelda music and music does a lot for me (laughs) in a video game. Another is, um, I wouldn't say story, but I would say like vibe. Like 
I think the game has a lot of personality and it sticks to its guns like across the board. It always kind of gives that same vibe throughout the game. And it's it's very distinct from other Zelda games. And I like that about it. And the other thing I would say is that for me, um, puzzles are probably the most important portion of gameplay in a Zelda game for me. And it goes heavy on the puzzles um, in side quests, in dungeons. I think there's good puzzle design kind of across the board through the game. Gotcha. Well, I mean, in fairness, Matt, the music, the personality and the puzzles, those are three things that we have not been having problems with in this game. Uh, Agreed. Yeah, I would agree with that. So there you go. Starting things off on a positive note. <laughs> I'm grabbing positivity by the horns. See, and I'm, I'm here to make you see the good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Someone really needs to do that job. Um, <laughs> and this is a really good episode for it because uh, end of game episodes, a lot of stuff going on here, especially a uh, lot of story content, too. So it's going to be fun to get into that and to talk about it. Um, do you. Uh, so I guess uh, last question here real quick. Would you say that you enjoy Spirit Tracks more or less than Phantom Hourglass? Because that's kind of the big recurring conversation Mm. that we've been having throughout the season. I think gameplay wise, I would say less. But overall, if I were to say play one of these two Zelda games, I would probably take Spirit Tracks over Phantom Hourglass just because Phantom Hourglass is such a short experience and i feel like uh spirit tracks has a lot more meat to it in terms of stuff to do in the game yeah for sure and it's it's so interesting because we've been talking a lot the last few weeks about side quests in this game um and the reality is that matt and i we've been talking about this with a few different people but matt and i um just didn't get up to that much side quest stuff in in our playthrough of spirit tracks and Mm. um reasons for that kind of abound right like the main one really being that uh, f- searching these things out requires you to spend a lot of time just sort of puts oh, yeah. putzing around the world in the train, you know? Um, yep. And so it's like, obviously we don't feel super incentivized to do that, you know, but also uh, I still feel now that we're at the end of the game, I still feel that this is not a Zelda game that does as good a job as other Zelda games of putting side quests in your path to find. Like, mm-hmm. I really just don't think it it did that too much, um, which is kind of a shame because I do like side quests in a Zelda game um, that they're one of my favorite parts of of my favorite games in this series. Um, and, yeah, this one just didn't really pop off for me in that way. But I'm glad to hear that you kind of had a different experience, Sam. And I mean, you know, like you're saying, I, obviously, in past playthroughs, like you've gone pretty far down the rabbit hole of like different side endeavors, you know, customizing your train fully and that whole thing. Right. So um, I know you probably had a little bit of this uh, in the back of your mind already and just kind of knew where to find some stuff without, um, you know, without having to try too hard. So, I mean, it it requires a lot of doubling back and tripling back. Very easy to miss a lot of the side quests. For sure. Yeah. But the bunnies, the bunnies are right there, Matt. They're right there off the track. And I caught many, many bunnies. I I am so surprised that when you saved an actual real life bunny before recording our episode last night, that that didn't translate to a bunny side quest reference of any kind during the episode. We really missed the, well, look, we were hairy. Would you say we missed the train on that? (sighs) Yes. (laughs) I would say we missed the train on that. We, we were, we were hair brained by the end of the day. We really were. Yeah. Matt saved a baby bunny last night. Sam in I did. real life adorable was, good job it was very cute you didn't kidnap it no uh, Gatsby was trying to herd it around the um H-E-R-D herd it around the um oh, okay that's much better backyard yes. and so I just saved I saved the uh baby bunny from the herding Gatsby yeah bunny got put back under the shed where its family lives so. yes oh how nice yeah there you go cool cool well um thanks for catching us up with your history with spirit tracks sam um obviously we're going to be talking in more specificity about a lot of this stuff as we kind of get further into the episode but that's <clears throat> all great general information um matt i say we go ahead and get housekeeping out of the way and then just dive into our discussion about how this game ends yes but you know what we have to do first uh we have to do that thing that we love that thing that we love, which is whiskey bit. Whiskey bit. Matt, you provided it tonight, so I, I, you get to tell everyone what we're drinking for whiskey bit. I did. We are drinking Woodford Reserve Double Oaked uh, Bourbon. It is a it's a nice ninety proof. 
uh, bourbon, as as most of uh, Woodford Reserve's catalog is. Yes. Uh, so it's it, it's sweet. It's got that nice oaky flavor, uh, very heavy on the leather and the and the sweet tannins. Uh, very very good. It's a it's an easy sipper. We don't really drink this one too much anymore. But when we were first getting into bourbon, that was one of the like good ones that yeah, we liked. Woodford a lot. Double Oak is a lot of people's like fancy pants intro bourbon. Yeah, it's, you know? it's definitely an intro intro to snobbery uh, <laughs> bourbon for sure. Uh, at least that was our gateway drug. Was uh, how much money would I have saved on bourbon if I never took my first sip of Woodford Double Oak? I don't prob- know. Probably a lot. I can't answer these questions, yeah. Matt. Uh, uh, these days, I usually use it as a mixer. It makes a great old fashioned. It does make a well. I think it's a little sweet for an old fashioned, personally. But um, great in a whiskey sour, actually. Okay, okay, cool, cool. cool. Balances that out a little so, bit. But anyway, there you go. Cheers, Woodford, Woodford double, oaked. double oaked. Cheers to beating spirit tracks and not uh, having to play it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to the last part of that sentence. Mm. Mm. I'm drinking water in a red solo cup. Hey, hey there you go. Red solo fun. cup. <laughs> yeah. I, I also do up. have a bottle of of like five dollar peach wine next to me, but I didn't bring a cup in here for that. So well, use maybe your if solo I finish cup. my water, right? Then I'll have my solo cup. Yeah, you gotta you gotta fill your solo cup up. It's it's there's a song about it. You have to play the song and fill up the solo cup. <laughs> you gotta save a little bit of that peach wine for when you play the peach game on its release day. Like Oh, you're right. Well, it was cheap. I could just get more. Yeah, it's sure. fine. There you go. It's <laughs> true. Cool. Cool, cool. All right. Well, housekeeping time, and then let's roll right into it. If you didn't know, Sacred Realms is a weekly reexamination of The Legend of Zelda, one little slice at a time. Sacred Realms drops every Wednesday and is available on all major podcast networks. Every week, we play a new section of a Zelda game, and then we sit down here to talk and to drop our hot takes. If that sounds fun to you, please head over to Apple Podcasts, hit that subscribe button, and be sure to leave us a review. Five-star reviews are greatly appreciated, and they have a chance to get a shout-out here on the show. If you uh, want more Sacred Realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacred realms pod to get access to our Discord channel, listener mail, vote on what game we play next, and much more. Additionally, one of the benefits that Master Sword patrons and above get is that we read their names every week here on the show. Those legendary individuals are... Naughty Nexus, Freddy, Brandon, Shrikewill, Joseph, Nick Tendo, Adam, Sakura Sky, Art, Jeremy, Dante2, Tom, Andy, Billy, Connor, Rachel, Shepherd Street, Matthew, Chris, Daniel, Fallout 907, Kelso, Tiffany the Star, Patrice, Stephanie, Darknuck, Il Maestro himself, Brian, George, Mike, Dylan, Lennon, Kolku, Rowan, Josh, Nick, Dante1, Gep, Brittany, Davy, Haru, The Mighty, Derek, Albert, Mark, Andy, Cameron, Daniel, Nick D, underscore TV, <sighs> Maximum Nichols, aka our guest of yesterday evening, a week ago for everyone listening to this. We're again, we're so sorry for what we did to you, Max. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it up to you somehow. <laughs> Garrett and Drew, these are the most legendary of individuals, and I would ride a magical train into a dark nether world with any of them any day of the week. Sure, why not? That sounds like a fun time. <laughs> Does it? I mean. Dark, I guess when you dark hit, netherworld sounds good when you hit those tiers of light and you choo choo the train and it goes quadruple speed that sounds kind of fun you know yeah that hey look yeah the the ultra speed it's going plaid i love that <laughs> they went to plaid <laughs> they went to plaid yeah exactly <laughs> but without further ado let's get into the sacred realms rundown which is a six-part analysis of what we played this week and the feelings that it made us feel part one is as always the plot recap this week read by matt after a uh, one-week hiatus Indeed. Uh, he loves keeping those finales for himself. It, it's it's they're nice and juicy. You got to really you get to gnaw on that bone a little bit. And, well, yeah. yeah, you especially. I mean, you like what is it like three hours, four hours for you to crank one of these finale scripts out these days? Yeah. Uh, generally speaking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you're so good at it. Ah, thanks, man. I appreciate <laughs> it. We're getting we're, we're 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 allowing you time to perfect your craft in time for us to get to our Tears of the Kingdom season. Oh, God, man, that's going to be which is going to absolutely <laughs> bury you. That's going to be rough. Uh huh. It's going to be fun. I'm going to help you with that one. Yeah, we're going to come up with the system. Yeah, please do. <laughs> All right. Anyway, <laughs> without further ado, take it away, Matt. We make our way back to the spirit train, finally with all the tools we need to confront the Demon King. The only issue is we have no idea where to find him ever since he absconded on the Demon Train with Cole. 
As we board the spirit train, we stop by the passenger car to check in on our passengers that accompanied us to the sand temple. Angene and Byrne are as well as can be expected given their recent ordeals, with Byrne appearing to be deeply unconscious but still breathing. Angie is indeed pleased to see the bow in our hands and is confident in its abilities to destroy Maladus with its purifying powers. As Zelda excitedly shares the news of our success and floats towards our Locomo friend, she asks Angie how we can find Maladus, to which Angie replies with the utmost regret that she has no way to help. Zelda is totally thrown off by this and falls to the ground, stunned into silence. It seems that while we were busy in our search for the bow, Angene was using all of her considerable power to track down the train, but has not had any success in her endeavors. As Angene bows her head in defeat, and Zelda and us look on in shocked surprise at this revelation, a voice chimes up from the corner of the passenger car. There is a way to find the train. Burn is speaking up from the corner we had, where he had appeared to be asleep telling us about an item called the Compass of Light. Underneath the area where Maladus was a resurrected is a hidden section of the Tower of Spirits, where Byrne hid this compass after using it to help Cole locate the demon train. Because the compass is an object passed down by the Spirits of Good, Cole can't touch it, but Byrne, as a locomo, could. After he had helped locate the demon train, he hid the compass deep within the final level levels of the tower so that no one could find it easily again. But now that we know where it is, there are no two people in Hyrule better suited to delving into the tower than us and Zelda. Before we set off, Angene reaches out with her ancient power and summons forth a sword of great might and magic called the Locomo Sword. She gifts us this blade and bades us to use it against the enemies of the spirits of good. With the new sword in, in hand, we set course back to the Tower of Spirits once more, blasting our way through the obstacles that block our path. Once at the tower, we climb to its peak to search for this hidden chamber that Burn told us about. On the top of the tower, we see two eye motifs like those that were in the chamber with the Bow of Light. We use the bow to shoot the eyes, and as they change color from blue to red, they open up a hidden staircase leading back down into the Tower of Spirits. Thus begins the long, inverted journey into the tower, down from the top, deeper and deeper into the unknown chambers. Each chamber holds a series of challenges unlike any we have faced so far. Everything we have learned along our journey, both on the other levels of the tower and in the temples, has only been a warm-up for these challenges. We find ourselves traversing floor after floor of puzzles, mazes, darkness-riddled rooms, and enemy-infested areas. We have no need to find Tears of Light to empower the Locomo Sword in order to stun the phantoms, which is all to the good because Zelda has to change her phantom armor more frequently than we have to change items. From regular phantoms to flame torch to warp to destructor phantoms, all of these play an integral part in our traversal. Pits of lava, giant boulders, boulders, riddles in the dark, and hordes upon hordes of invincible phantoms attempt to block us from our goal. But in the end, none of these succeed. After what feels like an eternity of switching phantom armor and descending through the tower, we find the compass of light and claim it for ourselves. Once we do, the forest rail map begins to glow with an on with an ominous, almost dark light that drives fear into our heart. This new glowing section of map reveals that to the west of our home village lies the entrance to the dark realm that Cole and Maladus used to escape. With our course set, we leave the Tower of Spirits at last to take the fight to our enemy. The trek to Aboda isn't long, but the minions of Maladus still try their best to stop us as we steam our way to the portal of the Dark Realm. Passing our home village is just another reminder of what we're fighting for. This fight is no longer just about stopping Maladus and getting Zelda's body back. In fact, Angene is no longer certain that that will even be possible. Instead, this is really about the peace and safety of our friends and family, as well as the welfare of the kingdom. Alarmingly, the portal to the Dark Realm has an enormous vortex of dark magic swirling overhead in the sky above that's visible even as far away as the Tower of Spirits. We make our way there with haste, and we find a new tunnel that has never been there before leading into the cliffs behind Aboda Village. 
We enter the tunnel and are immediately swarmed by tektites trying to block our path to the portal. These pests are no match for our expert cannon skills, and we quickly win through to the other side and have the portal in our sights. It sits on an island off the shore of the forest realm, surrounded by sheer peaks of forbidding stone, an incongruous sight juxtaposed against the beautiful sea surrounding it. A bridge of stone leads us over the water towards the portal, which, unlike the other portals around New Hyrule, glows with a sickly green energy reminiscent of swamp water. We know that there is no going back once we enter this portal. We will either defeat Maladus or be destroyed and lost in the Dark Realm forever. But this is what we have been working towards ever since that fateful day when we got our engineer's license. So we steel ourselves and plunge forward, full speed ahead, into the Dark World. The Dark World is not only dark, but it is infested with a necrotic presence more foul than any grave. The waters that spread beneath the tracks are somehow ghostly and far too black. And instead of any life or greenery, skulls protrude from the water and stand on rigid chains all around the tracks. There is no source of light except the ghastly glow emanating from the waters and the dark starless sky. Jagged rocks ring the area we find ourselves in, and all along the tracks are half a dozen armored bomb trains, but no sign of the demon train. We begin chugging along the tracks, ready to do our best to avoid the abominable death trains and attempt to find a path further into the dark realm, when we see a golden teardrop-shaped object appears on the track in front of us. As we roll over it, the spirit trade is suddenly and violently imbued with all the powers of the spirits of good. The train begins to glow with bright golden light and the engine kicks into overdrive, sending us flying across the tracks at incredible speeds. We blow the whistle with exuberance and the train accelerates to an even more insane speed, trailing golden dust like the tail of a comet. As we hurtle along at this speed, we start heading straight at one of the armored dark trains. Unable to turn our side or stop, we hang on for dear life as the collision becomes imminent. Instead of a crunch of metal on steel, we feel nothing at all. As we look up in shock, we see the dark train flying off the tracks into the distance, knocked from its root by the immense power of the spirit train. We make it our mission to hunt down and destroy the remaining five dark trains, picking up new tiers of light each time that their power wanes. We have to use multiple portals scattered around the tracks to access other parts of the tracks, but the, and the dark trains don't make it easy on us. Even with the powered up spirit train, our foes are fast and cunning, seeking to sandwich us between two of them and trying to wait out the power up from the tiers of light. But unfortunately for them, we have become quite the expert engineer on our journey. And with the help of the spirits, we wipe out every last one of the dark trains. Destroying the final train clears the path to the demon train, which the compass tells us is somewhere further on in the darkness. Even without the tracks, the empowered spirit train glides over the dark waters of the dark realm in search of our foe ready to become a legend with us as we try to stop Cole and Maladus in their tracks. As we continue on in the darkness, tracks suddenly appear beneath us in four straight parallel lines. While we travel ahead, we see an enormous purple and black vortex form in the sky ahead of us. It looks to be the twin of the vortex that we saw overhead of the portal leading into the dark realm, and we know that its presence bodes ill for the land. We continue traveling towards the portal, and as we do, another green portal opens up on the track to our left, and the demon train comes roaring out of it. It appears that the train is making a headlong run for the portal, and we have to stop it before Maladus can use whatever dark magic he plans to unleash on the land. Unfortunately, and predictably, the demon train isn't going to make that easy for us. The arsenal of weapons that it brings to bear on us puts our cannon to shame. Everything from multi-cannons to lasers to explosive barrels it tries to drop on the tracks. As we make the headlong run next to the demon train, we have to constantly be on the lookout for hazards on the tracks and use the switching lanes to avoid the enormous pile of ghostly metal when it tries to run us off the tracks completely. As we steam along towards the portal, the demon train brings everything it has against us, first throwing explosive barrels at us, which we shoot while still in their berths. 
After blowing up a handful of these while still inside the train, the demon train loses one of its compartments and speeds up, readying its next attack. This next attack comes in the form of a series of blue laser beams that it tries to use to cut us to ribbons, but a few well-placed shots from our cannon put these out of commission as well. Lastly, we arrive at the main engine of the monster train. It sprouts numerous laser spewing ports on its sides and begins shooting them out while also rotating its metal body to make them harder for us to hit. But alas for the demon train were crack shots with the cannon Alfonso installed and destroy each and every one of its weapons. With the train damaged, we move our spirit train ahead of the monstrous engine and begin blasting away at the horrid face that adorns the engine cab. After a series of direct hits, the demon train roars in agony and screeches to a final halt, defeated at last. The train stopped short of the portal, but we fear that it is still close enough for Maladus and Cole to use whatever dark magic they have planned. So we quickly run back to the passenger car to discuss the next steps with Angine and Byrne. As Andrine is addressing the task at hand, she asserts that she will be accompanying us for this final fight with Maladus in order to lend us her power. Byrne protests that she is still recovering from their earlier fight and that he should be the one to go with us instead. Zelda, however, puts them both in their place, pointing out that both of them are severely injured and still recovering, and that ultimately they would be more of a liability than a help in their current condition. She assures the two locomos that we can handle this ourselves, just as we have done in every temple and floor of the Tower of Spirits so far. Anjin smiles with pride and gives us one last gift to help in the fight, a suit of golden phantom armor for Zelda to use. With the golden phantom armor, the locomo blade, and the bow of light, we have all the tools we need to do battle with the Demon King at last. So we make our way to the Demon Train and climb atop its ghastly shell. At the far end of the long train, Cole and Maladus, in Zelda's body, are hovering, looking at the portal ahead of them. As we climb to the top of the train, Zelda proclaims in a loud voice that Cole will go no further, and his plans are at an end. Cole's exasperation is evident as he turns to rage at us for our interference. He cries out to Maladus to give us the punishment we deserve. And as he says this, the demon train begins moving once more, heading slowly but surely towards the portal and leaving the spirit train behind. As we continue moving forward, Cole celebrates Maladus's completed resurrection, finally drawing our attention to the floating body of Zelda directly above him. There is an evil pinkish glow emanating from Zelda's writhing body, and when it opens its eyes, we see the insane red and yellow eyes of a demon shining out from our friend's face. The evil power is palpable, and as Maladus joins Cole, we join Phantom Zelda, ready to face down this evil duo at last. As Maladus stands at the far end of the train, Cole comes to float nearer to us and torment us with his magic. Apart from his insanely annoying chatter, he also seems to be aware of Zelda's fear of rats, so he constantly creates little magical vermin to try to scare her. As Zelda pushes towards Maladus, we have to protect her from the magical rats to help keep moving her forward. If any of the rats touches her armor, Cole uses his magic to take control of Zelda's armor and puppet her around while trying to hit us with her incredibly powerful phantom sword. Using the boomerang, we can sever the connection, but it makes progress slow. Eventually, eventually, Maladus joins in the fun and starts blasting away with magical lasers, trying to get around Zelda's impenetrable phantom armor and hit us directly. As long as we stay behind Zelda and protect her from Cole's rats, we continue moving up the train. When we finally reach the front of the train, Zelda grabs Maladus in a bear hug of unbreakable strength. Maladus flails and levitates them both off the train while Cole flails annoyingly around in the background. As Zelda and Maladus hover in the air, Zelda calls out to us to shoot her body with the bow of light to expel Maladus once and for all. We take aim and let an arrow fly, striking Zelda's body dead center and imbuing it with power from the sacred bow. As Zelda continues to struggle with the Demon King in her body, the power of the bow continues to work into Maladus. As the struggle reaches its peak, the light flashes out in a blinding blast, and Maladus screams in rage, and Cole flees into the darkness. 
As Maladus is affected by the bow's power, the demon train begins to explode from within, bellowing in pain and eventually crashing, completely and utterly destroyed. We awaken to the sound of Zelda's concerned voice. The first thing we're aware of is the light around us, and next is the rock underneath us. It appears we're no longer in the Dark Realm, that with the destruction of the Demon Train, we were somehow transported back to Hyrule. The pain from the crash is immense, but it looks like it pales in comparison to whatever Maladus is enduring within Zelda's body. As we watch, Zelda's body twitches spasmodically and expels a blue face with red and yellow eyes that floats in the air nearby. Apparently, the bow has exorcised Maladus from Zelda's body at last, freeing her from the Demon King's grasp temporarily. Before Maladus can repossess her body, Zelda flies to it, attempting to enter it just as she does the Phantom Martyr. Instead, she passes right through her own skin, with only a slight musical tone to indicate that any contact was made at all. As she dive bombs her body again and again, trying desperately to reassert control over her own skin, she cries out in frustration and fear. Nearby, Cole regains consciousness, appearing as if from nowhere. He screams for Maladus to hurry and repossess the body before Zelda can. As Zelda is frantically trying to figure out what to do, Maladus begins to charge the body. Right before he reaches Zelda, a magical shield blocks his path, stopping him cold. Zelda looks around in surprise to see Burn standing near our prone form, throwing up the magical barrier with every ounce of his considerable locomo strength. He tells Zelda that she has to concentrate on the power within her body and the power within her soul, the power of the spirits. She has to concentrate with all her strength in order to reclaim her body. So Zelda does just that. Calling out to the sacred power residing in her body, she pleads with it to lend her its strength. She calls out also to her ancestor Tetra for that strength, and with an effort of will fueled by her ancestors, she at last merges with her body to become complete once more. Once she does, her body begins to drop out of the sky like a rock, no longer able to fly like the spirit she had been moments before. As Byrne maintains the shield, he yells at us to go, go right now, to catch the falling princess. We make it just in time to act as a pillow for our friend, breaking her fall with our body. Zelda sits up and revels in the joy of finally being reunited with her body, giving us a big hug of thanks and relief. But the joy is short-lived as we hear a cry of agony from nearby and look up to see Byrne encased in a sphere of dark magic by Cole and Maladus. As we watch in helpless horror, Burn turns to face us with sorrow in his eyes before being completely disintegrated by Maladus. Cole crows with glee and then asks Maladus to do away with us and take Zelda's body back so that their plans can proceed. Unfortunately for Cole, it seems that Maladus has had enough of his pestering. Maladus gobbles Cole up like a snack possessing the little imp's body and transforming into an enormous blue beast. Maladus's new form lands on the ground before us, its two horns poised to strike, and the magic of the Demon King transforms the sky all around into a stormy, roiling mass of black clouds. While Maladus has taken possession of Cole's body, he says that Cole is rejecting the possession. But, while he is able to, he plans to unleash destruction upon the world. As Maladus roars in insane fury and bloodlust, Zelda calls us to action against the Demon King, ready to end it once and for all. Maladus takes up his position close by, and Zelda calls out to us to protect her while she charges up her spiritual powers to smite Maladus. As Zelda focuses, Maladus begins launching flaming boulders from his maw at her. We use the Locomo Sword to deflect dozens and dozens of these missiles. His rage and ferocity drive him to throw boulders with furious abandon, sometimes up to five at a time. But we have plenty of experience protecting Zelda and successfully deflect them all. After what seems like a million years, Zelda is finally ready to smite Maladus with her power. Zelda stops us mid-fight and tells us that she thinks we need to combine her power with the power of the spirit flute. 
Unsure how exactly we're supposed to do that with the literal Demon King standing there, Zelda whisks us, whisks us off to some kind of secluded sacred realm where Maladus can't reach us. Once there, she teaches us the song that we need to play, which seems to be a beautiful arrangement of pieces of each of the Locomo songs that we have played to empower the spirit tracks. After a lot of practice, we finally get it down and perform the duet with Zelda. As we continue playing, we feel the power of all the Locomo sages join us, lending their power to our song and strengthening, strengthening the strike aimed at Maladus. As the song completes, we find ourselves back in the material world, on the bare piece of rock facing Maladus. The song appears to have weakened him and also painted a target of light on his back. Zelda takes the bow of light from us and tells us to get the Demon King's attention so that she can shoot him in the new weak spot with the arrows of light. With the game plan set, we move in to distract the monstrous beast, so we start slashing away at his invulnerable hide with the Locomo Sword. As Maladus turns his rage on us, Zelda takes aim with the bow of light, landing a perfect shot right in the center of the glowing pattern on his back. This stuns the Demon King, allowing us to move in with the Locomo Sword to slash away at the glowing gem in the center of his head. The giant horns protect the gem, but we're able to break one of them off completely before Maladus recovers. We settle into the rhythm, getting Maladus to face us while Zelda aims with the bow, once he's stunned, moving in with the sword. Eventually, both horns lie on the ground and the gem is exposed. With one more arrow, Zelda stuns Maladus and we start slashing away with furious abandon at the gem containing the Demon King's power. We chip and shatter the gem and then drive the blade of the Locomo Sword directly into the center of the Demon King's forehead. We struggle as hard as we can to drive the sword all the way through, but our strength alone can't drive the blade into the enormous skull. Zelda runs up next to us and throws her strength into the effort, and finally the blade slides home. There's a blinding flash of light as the gem shatters completely, and with its loss, Maladus rears and roars in pain. Light bursts from Renz in the Demon King's skin, and he is engulfed in white light as his spirit is destroyed once and for all. As the Demon King's influence begins to fade, the skies over Hyrule return to the normal beauty of dusk. We stand on the bare slab of rock with Zelda, stunned at the suddenness of the completion of our quest and mourning the loss of Burn. As we stand there, Anjean rolls up to join us. Zelda apologizes to the old Locomo for the loss of her apprentice. Anjean appears calm about the situation, saying that Burn wouldn't have had it any other way and that there should be no regrets. She rolls her way a little bit past us, saying, Besides, our kind are the servants of the spirits. We don't disappear that easily. As she says this, she lifts her arms to the sky, and a small ball of blue light coalesces between her raised hands. She tells us that Burns' spirit endures, and that in time he will once again take form, although without his memories of his previous life. So at least we know that Burn will be mostly whole once more. Anjean continues, telling us that as locomos, they were not only here to protect the spirit tracks, but to watch over mankind. But it appears that they are no longer needed now that the Demon King has been destroyed. With their task complete, the locomos plan to return to the heavens to be with the spirits they serve. Sure now that mankind will do just fine on their own. Her final words to us are to implore Zelda to watch over the land, and for us to help her in all she does. And with that, Anjean turns into a bright purple ball of light and ascends into the sky. We can see the other spirits of the Locomos Ages join her and Burn as they all return to the sky together. As night falls around Hyrule, we know that the land is safe at last from the threat of the Demon King. And even with the Locomo gone, we feel a sense of hope and joy for the future that Princess Zelda will build 
with us always by her side. Well done, as always, Matt. Uh, That brings us to part two, which is our takes, where we talk about the section of the game and how it made us feel. Um, So uh, the the way that we've kind of been doing this the last few weeks, Sam, is that we've been rolling our discussion about the Tower of Spirits chunk for the week into this section. Um, I Just because we also had a dungeon on all those weeks, right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and suggest that we actually save this week's Tower of Spirits to talk about in the dungeon map in addition to the actual mechanics of the final boss fight and stuff. Um, And we save our takes for just our discussion about the way that this game ends, you know, story and the way that it all wraps up. Yeah, absolutely. So, Sam, you're the guest of the evening. I'm going to send it over to you first. How do you feel about the story of Spirit Tracks, and how do you feel about its ending? (laughs) Well, uh, the story is so detached from anything else in the Zelda world that it's hard to appreciate it like as its own thing, because part of what makes Zelda story special for me is the way that they all kind of connect, not necessarily in the most perfect timeline ever, but they're all linked in some way, shape or form. And I I think I personally have a problem with the way spirit tracks kind of like introduces and then gets rid of these, these uh, poor locomos within a year of a span of 100 years. Yeah. If that makes sense. So, so where we're at with spirit tracks is it's a hundred years from, or sorry. Yeah. It's a hundred years from phantom hourglass. Right. Yes. And so we're, we're to believe that in the span of 100 years, uh, all of this land has come, has filled in thanks to who knows what, uh, the spirits, the gods, whatever. They filled in all of this land that all these new creatures have popped up. The locomos have been charged with protecting humanity for some reason. Um, also, where did they come from? I don't know. It doesn't matter. They're here. And then we get one bad guy in 100 years and he is ended and then the locomos go away like that's that's essentially the story of spirit tracks right it doesn't it doesn't really make sense in the zelda universe or in any universe so i don't love the story of spirit tracks but i will say it does end with zelda and link holding hands and i do love that (laughs) it's it's really cute right i think to me the ending of this story um the big win was really – and this has been true over the last few weeks, right? It's that continuing evolution of the relationship between the Link and the Zelda in this game. Like I really do think Spirit Tracks Zelda – well, obviously Spirit Tracks Zelda as a character. We said last week, I still feel that way this week at the end of the game. One of the great Zeldas. Absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. I do think so, yes. Yeah. Again, uh, low bar, but yes. it needs to be said. Yeah, but re- like really a standout. And her relationship with Link in this game has it, – it's it's got a lot of that personality that you've been mentioning, Sam, right? Where mm-hmm. they have – a lot of you know a lot of spark between them not necessarily romantic spark but just like as two characters interacting in a video game there's a lot happening there there's a lot of fun moments of like expression and collaboration between them um and that that was definitely true this week that kind of maintained its its way all the way throughout the entirety of the game which i definitely appreciated but uh yeah i i don't know i think to me the ending of this story now that we know everything right um like we didn't necessarily learn anything completely new about about the locomo this week you know um we just got the resolution of their whole story right they've ascended back to the heavens now like they they don't need to guard over humanity anymore but it's so interesting to me because what you're saying is totally true sam like humans only got to this this island kingdom uh, like a hundred years ago, right? And we're, I guess we're supposed to assume the Locomo were here before that, that they were like indigenous to this continent and that they had been guarding over Maladus, like sealed and all that. 
but it's like, but why? Like, who who yeah. are they protecting from Maladus if no one is inhabiting the island? <laughs> right. Like, what is what was the whole war about? Like, does Maladus just want to blow up the mountains? Like, or was there other people there first? Yeah. And like, it's just the Hy- the Hylians that showed up a hundred years ago, but like the town of Whittleton was actually still there, and now like basically the Hylians pseudo conquered New Hyrule. I was going to say, did 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 <laughs> Tetra is, is this and, colonialism? Uh, did Tetra and Link like colonize New Hyrule? I think they did, guys. Seems like it. I think oh. they colonize. They're colonizers. Oh, okay. Well, that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> Um, it's you, only bad if they did it with lots of murder and it seems like they probably didn't. I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to believe that there was a peaceful merging of culture that happened here. I choose to believe that the people who were there welcomed them with open arms and said, Hey, we like you guys. And they said, Hey, we like you guys too. This is how things were done over there. What do you think? And they said, that sounds great. And everyone just coexisted harmoniously. Everyone lived <laughs> their lives in an equitable situation. Exactly. Of course. To be fair, there is a lot of, of unused land in this world. So I think it's probably OK that they moved in. Yes, mm-hmm. we're, we're going to hope so. We're, it's all on the up and up. Yeah. Yes. So I don't know. I mean, let's talk about um, let's talk about some of the main characters and how they wrap up in this last section of the game here. Um, we, you know, we finally get our resolution to characters like Cole and Burn and the, the whole cast. Right. Uh, Matt, do you feel like the answers that we got about the main villain of this game, Maladus, and Cole trying to resurrect him. The story that that was telling. Yeah. Do you do you feel like this was a satisfying conclusion for what Spirit Tracks has been setting up so far? No. Really? Okay. <laughs> I mean, like, there, there was no anything at all other than Maladus just wanted to destroy everything. I don't get villains whose sole purpose is just, like, blow it all up. I don't get it. Like... Unless you're talking about like the apocalypse, like Ragnarok, you know, Surtur coming to destroy Asgard yeah. with his flaming sword. Like that's just like all apocalypse stuff. But like outside of that, I get it when Ganondorf wants to take over the kingdom of Hyrule and rule it himself. Sure. Power grab. I can. I understand that. He, he envied that wind, man. Exactly. Um, but the whole thing where it's just like, I want to destroy everything. Like, no, okay, why? What What do you get out of that? You get nothing. And then there's nothing. Does, do you just want nothing? Because you can go off and do nothing by yourself <laughs> without destroying everything. If you just want nothing, go continue living in the dark realm and just hang out over there. No one's going to bother you, I promise. Yeah. Um, so it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um and it's fine. And also, like, Maladus has, like, three lines in the entire game. And one of them is talking about how Cole is trying to resist him taking over his body, which also doesn't make sense because if Cole is, like, Maladus's, uh primo squeeze number one, who's, like, big cheerleader <laughs> Maladus guy... You would think it would be the ultimate honor for Maladus to inhabit his body, and he'd be like totally on board. Well, this with is that. my big question: what was what was Cole into this whole situation for? What like, were either of them into this situation? Well, I get, for? so I'm willing to accept Maladus as like, yeah, you're right. It it makes no logical sense having a villain who's just like destroy the whole world, right? But it is a thing that happens, you know. Sure. I'm not saying it makes Maladus a great villain or sure. anything, but okay. it's a it's a trope, you know. Sure. Um, so I'm willing to give Maladus a little bit of a pass here. I, I'm definitely putting Maladus a little bit higher on the scale than Bellum, right? <clears throat> because if nothing else, Maladus ended the game with some personality, you know, or or at least like it. OK, I, I see your look. I see your look. Uh-huh. Um, if not personality, at least Maladus was a character, right? Sure. Whereas Bellum was just kind of another another monster, you know, okay. another evil monster. Um, but uh So in addition to that, you have Cole acting as a mouthpiece for Maladus. And so that combination of things kind of results in a situation that is like it's a net gain over the over the ending of Phantom Hourglass, I think. Uh, Oh, yeah, sure. But I still just don't understand what Cole's whole goal here was. Um, I never got a better feel for that character besides just, you know, I wear two top hats and I just like to hang around and, and look evil. Right. And do the Mario giggle every once in a while. Yeah, exactly. And have way a, too frequently. And have a, a musical theme that gets really stuck in your head, <laughs> like really, really stuck in your head. 
Uh, I can't get it out. Get it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, no, that's, that's the fair. real villainy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cole's musical theme. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. But it, anyway, it's like the thing is, um, I don't necessarily need all of these things to have tidy, thematically harmonious resolutions. Right. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but I, I would like I would have liked to have seen just a little bit more of that because we did get moments of actual pathos uh here towards the very end, right? Like I thought the moment where Burns sacrificed himself was actually if like a fairly effective moment. Like the last minute kind of like turn of burn, right? Mm-hmm. Um last week going into this week, and then the moment where he kind of sacrifices his body and we think he dies. Uh you know, this game can pull things off like that. So I was just looking for a little bit more complexity from from Cole uh, specifically as the mouthpiece of Maladus here. I agree completely. Other Outside of his uh, sinister giggling and summoning of uh, electric mice, I, I got nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, So what about you, Sam? Like as so we're, we're I guess we're taking Cole and Maladus together as a villain duo. Um where like how how do you feel about them stacking them up against other Zelda villains? Yeah, I'm not and I don't know if this is cuz I like skipped a little bit of dialogue at some point or or what, but I am not crazy about uh Maladus in terms of I don't understand the plot of why he needs to inhabit Zelda's body specifically, but then he can also inhabit Cole's body, so that's not true. Uh, also, if if Cole is fighting back, was Zelda's body not fighting back? In some, like, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, and I don't like Cole because I don't like how he looks. So <laughs> I always, <laughs> like, I hate the things that he does with his eyes. I just don't like it. I don't. I don't like seeing when he does like the cross-eyed thing. Um, and I, I think like he's just he's like annoying as a character. And then he's also annoying when it comes to the final battles. He's just annoying more than he's not scary. He's not funny. He's not interesting. He's not I don't, he's not deep in any way. He's just annoying to me. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. I, I'm not crazy about either of them together or separately. Um, I will say at least the one thing they have going for them at least is that they were able to make um, a beast Ganon like appearance when fused at the end. So there's that. Yeah. I was okay with that. Yeah, for sure. And I thought that that was so interesting, right? Because one of the things that we've been so excited about uh, with Maladus as a character in spirit tracks is uh, the promise of a non Ganon main villain, right? Um, I mean, that was one of the things that Matt and I love so much about Minish Cap. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. last month and like as we were playing through that game, um, having Vati as the main villain and having Ganon not be a part of it at all. And, and like the fact that Vati was presenting very differently than Ganon, especially in the final boss fight, right? Like a final boss fight with Vati was completely different than any time mm-hmm. you've ever fought Ganon, right? Um, and so it was interesting to me that Spirit Tracks is here with a, a again, a final boss, a fi- like a big bad who's not Ganon. And then at the very end of things kind of ends up falling into a bit of Ganon territory, right? Like not so much in terms of the mechanics of the fight, because I would say the, the Maladus fight is pretty dissimilar. Well, actually I say that it's, uh, mm, it's definitely different than most Ganon fights, but now I'm thinking of like a uh, dark beast Ganon in breath of the wild, right? Where you have to hit the, the aim points on his body with, the yeah, light with arrow, the light arrows, right? Yeah. Which definitely happens in this fight. Definitely. But anyway, uh, that aside, but like visually this like combined coal and Maladus is like, you're right, Sam feeling a very dark beast Ganon, like traditional Ganon boar sort of appearance. Um, and, I, and I'm curious why they chose to do that that way. Um, knowing that it would immediately draw comparisons to, um, to Ganon. Um, I do think that, uh, that fused Maladus does look pretty cool. Like I think the character model is pretty neat looking. Um, uh, he loses a few serious points for me in that he's got a bit of a like a, a ginger Wario mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. no, no doubt. No doubt. Um, 
But I agree with everything you're saying about Cole specifically, Sam. Like, And it's disappointing because the Zelda series has got a long history of the evil sidekick with a lot of personality and mm-hmm. typically doing that pretty well, right? Like I'm thinking Gear Him and I'm thinking Skull Kid, you know? It's like it's it's something that – uh, it's something that like even Zant, I guess, unfortunately, could fall into this category, right? Still wish Zant had been the main villain. Yeah, um, should have been. Yeah, but uh, anyway, but Cole is like they're trying to do a similar thing and just not succeeding at it quite as much. I agree completely. Yes. Yeah. Um, he's like he's like some kind of evil St. Patrick's Day leprechaun that you see in like a I, ho- I said that at the beginning of the season and I stick to it. Like evil a, like a horror movie that's St. Patrick's Day themed. Right. And Cole's the bad guy. It's like yeah. a slasher. You know? Yeah. And, and it's bad. It's <laughs> low budget and the characters annoying, not scary. You have to scroll through three pages of Netflix to get to and, it. And all you get is the damsel in distress going ah the whole exactly. time. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. It's just bad. <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. Um so anyway, yeah, like at the end of the day, we don't we just don't know that much more about Cole or Maladus than we did at the very start of the game. And yeah, I, I, I would say we know next to nothing about either of them. Yeah, which is kind of a bummer. We know a lot more about the well, I, we don't know more about the Locomo, but we at least get resolution to the Locomo. Right. Um, sure. This whole situation where they kind of depart the world uh, because they no longer need to guard it for us. Peace. Yeah, exactly. Um, how did you feel, Sam? How did you, how do you feel about this whole burn situation? I know I already said that I felt like it was emotionally effective, right? His whole yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I didn't feel particularly tied to burn in any way, but um, I think one of the lines that came up when you're you're supposed to believe that he has died, and you kind of see his little spirit orb was something like the spirit. The spirit is resistant, I think. Um, And that I thought was effective. I thought it was kind of like a nice, like emotional, like, oh, like, right. Zelda reincarnation. Like this is uh, something that's true across the Zelda series. So it was a nice way to kind of close out his story, I think. Matt, how about you? Yeah, I thought it was fine. Um, I, I always hate it when they bring back characters who do the big sacrifice. I think it just cheapens the whole thing. Well, this is like this happened with Midna. Yeah. Right. And like, I I understand it somewhat more with Midna just because they wanted to really capitalize on the character. Burn didn't have enough of a character to like be emotionally invested in that. You wanted to see him back. He was much more impactful as the sacrifice, uh, the willing sacrifice. Right. Like I, I think just let people die it's not that like look i get that you're targeting this game towards kids and maybe that's all that this is is just like oh we can't have someone die permanently in a kid's game who isn't the bad guy like maybe that's what this is but if so it's still kind of cheap can you think of any main non-villain character in a zelda game who has died and not come back <clears throat> and that that question is the for butler's you as well, son Sam. The butler's son uh, in Jorah's mask. That doesn't count. <laughs> do do ghost coming back count? Uh, no, no. They have to. It has to be. There has to be finality, right? Like this person has to be dead, and dead ski, dead The game just has to like sit in it. Mm. I don't. Well, the champions are dead in Breath of the Wild. Oh, that's fair. Okay. I mean, granted, they it's do get, sad. yeah, yeah, it is, it is. I mean, they get kind of their Obi-Wan ghost spirit moments. Yeah, right, right, that's true. Okay, but yeah, good points, but like, still, okay, Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, uh, like, obviously, just at base, much more mature games than Spirit Tracks anyway, yes. right? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree with the point. Like, I I think that Burn, but uh, although there is a point to be made that in in the fact that he's going to be essentially, I guess, reincarnated with his, no memories of the, yeah, the right. street. So he is dead. Yeah. I mean, there is the like, burn that we knew is dead. There is a loss of personality that's kind of intrinsic to that situation. So I, I, I still give it points for effectiveness. I, uh, was it super effective? I don't know, but yeah, it was, I would say that it was not very effective. If you're, if we're grading it on the Pokemon scale, um, it w- wasn't a critical <laughs> hit. It wasn't super effective. It wasn't even normal effective. It would have been normal effective had they just left him dead, dead. And Angie had said, like, I'm so glad he was able to redeem himself in the end or something like that. Like that would have been that would have been normal effective. Yeah. Anyway. Well, and it's nice because we do get kind of shades of like 
obviously Angie isn't too put out by Burns like betrayal here, you know? Yeah, which is weird. She really got over that quickly. <laughs> yeah. She did. <clears throat> it's like, it's okay. It's no thing. Um, I also like how um, before you, you leave the train to go into this final fight, Angie and Burn are both like, I'm going to help you. And Zelda it's like, nah. and Link are both like, you are of no help to me whatsoever. <laughs> so no, thank you. <laughs> nah, fam, you stay put. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so nice, too, because it's there is a level of story continuity there. Like, Burn kicked Angie's ass and we kicked Burn's ass and they're both in bad shape. So it's like... <laughs> Yeah, of course. Like, it makes sense why we wouldn't send them up to the top of the demon train to go <laughs> to go fight Cole with his electric mice and all that shit. Um, yeah. By transitive property, we could cook Angie's ass. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it Elder Wand rules? Yes. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. cool. Neat. Uh, of course, Angie would probably have to get up and out of her little wheelchair, which we now know is not fused to her body. <laughs> She's not a centaur. She has feet. <laughs> She does have feet. Yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> Disturbing, honestly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, actually, at the end of the day, though, I think I, I do like Angie as a character, and I like the Angie and Burn dynamic. Like, there's a simplicity to it that is pretty standard for the Zelda series as a whole, right? Like, sure. um, games pre-Tears of the Kingdom, Breath of the Wild don't delve into those kinds of relationships all that much more than this. Yeah. And I do I, I do like them as a storyline. I think this was probably the most emotionally uh, the second most emotionally affecting part of the game for me after just the Link and Zelda relationship. Uh, the burn and Angie relationship. Yeah, yeah it, sure. Yeah, I would I would get on board with that. And that is me saying that is it literally just kind of bopped my needle a little bit. Not like mm-hmm. it didn't really move it too much, but yes, I would agree with that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the circumstances of the surrounding sort of the, the end of this game. Uh, one of which is the reveal that this is a Zelda game with a dark world. Spoiler yeah, alert. Spoiler alert. No. Yeah. Dark worlds. Woo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Coming out of the woodwork. I mean, how do you how do you feel, Sam? How do you feel about just the setting of the entire end of this game? Right, like basically going into the nether world of New Hyrule. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. It's kind of it feels like phoning it in a bit. You know, it's funny to me. It felt, and I know that it's dark world setting, <laughs> but in my head, I'm like, I'm on it in space. I'm like, it's just like a rainbow road situation. This is what it feels like to me. And I kept forgetting that I wasn't in space. I was in the dark world. This is different, <laughs> but you know, I think it's fine. It's whatever. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a fair comparison. I hadn't thought about it that way, but it definitely didn't feel, at least when you got to the demon train part, it didn't feel dark worldy. It did feel more like outer space. Yeah. Um, when you're, finally taking it to the armored dark trains that felt kind of dark worldy just because of the portals and the skulls and the everything else going on. Sure. But, um, yeah, I, I agree with that, Sam. So here's my question. The whole crazy <laughs> temple that's poking up out of the ocean that gets you into the dark world. Mm-hmm. Did that just appear or has, <laughs> or has like nobody I noticed I think, it? I think it's supposed to have been there the whole time, but I, <laughs> It doesn't make sense, but no, it doesn't make sense. It's just like it's literally right around the corner from your house. Yeah, like, seriously, had, behind, it's in your back door, man. Your if, backyard. If they had just like included an animation of it sprouting out of the ocean or something, then it would have been fine. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Agreed. But so definitely, I mean, it's a huge ass structure, uh, and it does look really cool. I so here's here's my my whole thing. Um, I like the dark realm as a concept. I mean, there's a lot of echo to the way that Zelda games typically operate here, right? Where it's like, yeah, there's a dark world or another world or another dimension or whatever. That happens a lot in this series. Um, And I don't even necessarily mind that it's a complete 100% train mechanic area. You know, Um, I do sort of wish like if you were going to have a dark realm you know, maybe just include that in the game a little earlier mm. than this. Yeah. You know, agreed. Um, have like have portals where you can like slip into the dark realm uh, starting about the halfway point of spirit tracks and just incorporate it a little more often. You know, maybe that's your fast travel mechanic as you go through a portal into a into the dark realm, a short little jaunt and then yeah. out, out the other portal. And it's like, yeah, it's more dangerous down there or something, but yeah. it can get you from one side of the map to the other a lot more quickly 
than oh, that would be just st- trucking around. Immediate punch up. Yeah. I mean, I know we have the warp gates in this game, right? But those so- it's such a it's such a weird system still. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think it's a great fast travel mechanic. But anyway, um, yeah, I think it would have been fun to have been able to spend more time in the Dark Realm earlier on in the game. But just as a setting for the final boss battle, I liked the Dark Realm actually quite a bit. Um, and I, I really kind of enjoyed and not talking about the mechanics because we're going to get into that in the dungeon map. But um, I enjoyed the whole train duel setting. When, yeah, I did too. Actually, train. Yeah, I, I did too. I thought it was. Mm-hmm. I thought this was better done than Ghost Ship Bellum Infested Ghost Ship. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I agree with that. Um, but we're we're kind of having a lot of conversation while skirting around the mechanics of all of these things. Um, and and like I really do want to talk about the mechanics and the nitty gritty of like were these fights fun and what happened and all that. So, um. I don't want to get uh, too far ahead of ourselves. Do we have anything else we want to say about just like general our takes about the end of Spirit Tracks before we get into the dungeon map? I mean, um, we should probably take a few minutes to mention that this game like does have kind of a weird and abrupt ending. Like after the Locomo go back up to the sky or whatever, you know, you leave Zelda and Link holding hands. And then after that, we get basically no extra resolution or or, or nothing past you're, that point. You're done. Yeah, you're done. You like go we have, home. We have a post credit scene yeah. of Zelda sitting in her study, you know, um, apparently signing engineer certificates. Maybe I guess she doesn't do the uh, ceremony anymore, which is sad. Oh, yeah. yeah. But bad. we get we get no Ocarina of Time style. Like, here's a credit scene showing where everyone ended up, you know? Yeah. No, I, I, you're mm-hmm. totally right. Yeah. Um, I guess you get the little sketches during the during the actual credits that kind of show everybody being like, OK, yeah. Do you count, do you count those as canon or are those more like I, uh, do, I do? I do. It's just concept like, art. Uh, I well, I was interpreting them as concept <clears throat> art myself. OK, but see, I was interpreting them as sketches of post game activities. Well, they show you one of like go Zelda flying next to the train. Oh, like that's it's the a, very last one you see. That's so. a good point. But Sam, I'm, but, oh yeah. Uh, what I'm thinking is, uh, you just said something that maybe sparked this thought, but um, and you said that we don't get like a post credit scene where we see where everyone ended up. But don't they just end up where they started in this case? Because the game kind of starts with everything's fine, but the train tracks are disappearing, and then the tower falls. Like so, really it goes from everything's fine back to everything's fine except the locomo are gone well that's a good point yeah but except nobody except for i think zelda even knew that the locomo were there right <laughs> <You know? laughs> so like so all of these other villages that we've just visited they're just eh. <laughs> they probably barely knew anything was going on yeah they're all fine <laughs> yeah the tower of spirits like everyone's gonna look back on it in a year and be like hey you remember that weird week where the tower of spirits was in pieces and was floating that was weird huh <laughs> think they imagined it yeah yeah so yeah no it's 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 weird like I, I definitely i mean a link between worlds right the end of that game has got a very uh, like a lot of game. i know it's great it, and and the ending has <laughs> so got good. a lot of closure right oh right. duh of course we talked about this with you sam you were on that episode i think I, we talked i think i was on the last episode for that too you were yeah um but i mean like Comparing the end of Spirit Tracks to something like that, right? I just think that there was an extra level of like, I don't know, you feeling like you've really accomplished something here that we didn't get. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's fair. Yeah. Um, I also like did teacher become the new chancellor? Oh, mm, maybe they were just like, you know, we don't need, <laughs> need a, a chancellor, chancellor anymore. That bad. It's fine. That's fair. Why do you need a chancellor if you have a, a princess? Like, yeah, a monarch. Yeah. Chancellors and monarchs don't really go together unless the monarch is a uh, purely uh, ceremonial title, like in the UK. And to that point, how did Cole get his job in the first place? Yeah, who vetted him? It was a bad idea. Whoever know. vetted him needs to be fired immediately. <laughs> They should have just asked him to take his hats off. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you're you're the in the throne room of the princess. You cannot wear top hats. 
Mm -hmm. Then immediately discovered the issue. Mm -hmm. So many issues could have been avoided. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into part three, which is the dungeon map where we talk about this week's dungeon from mechanics to music and more. Obviously, this week we're wrapping up a lot of stuff into this. We're talking about the Tower of Spirits. We're talking about the actual final boss encounters, which, sure, why not? Why don't we roll the whole train combat in the Dark Realm into that as well? Sure. Um, So let's start with the Tower of Spirits. And Sam, we're going to – so what we've been doing is checking in with all of our guests on – where they're at with the Tower of Spirits just as a concept and especially how you like how you uh, feel about it versus the Temple of the Ocean King. Mm. Well, I think as a concept, I'm pretty, pretty OK with the Tower of Spirits. I think I have kind of a love hate relationship with it because there's a lot that I actually do like about it because they're it's very puzzle based. Uh any part of the tower, which is many parts of it, that for me involve um, needing to plan out where you're moving things in terms of, you know, phantom or the different kinds of phantoms um, or making sure buttons are pressed in the right order or things like that, I'm into. But what I'm not into is anything that's there purely to be anxiety inducing, which is also a large portion <laughs> of the Tower of Spirits. So I think, um, especially as you get farther in, I like it less and less when there's like dark rooms, um, phantoms that are really hard to avoid and things like that. But overall, as a mechanic, I'm okay with it. Yeah. So Matt and I, this is one area of the game that Matt and I have been pretty positive about. The Tower of Spirits is something that we've been enjoying overall uh, with one week where we didn't really like it so much. And that was the week where it was all darkness. Um, Yeah, the dark is the worst. Yeah, not fun. Um, Let's talk about specifically this chunk this week. Man, did you feel like you were in here screwing around with the Tower of Spirits for like four hours? Forever. <laughs> forever. Oh my God, it never stopped. And <laughs> the biggest thing that made it drag on and on and on and on and on was having to go back and forth between floor 29 and every other floor to constantly switch out phantom bodies. I know I said last week that it was really cool that you switched phantom bodies with Zelda. Well, you know what? I didn't want to then go do it 27 times. <laughs> like I think once was good, maybe twice, but 27 rotations of different phantom bodies was 25 too many. Okay. Cool. So that's where you're at with it. Yeah. <laughs> The puzzles themselves were good and they made good utilization of the various types of phantoms, but God, just why? Why did I have to go up three flights of stairs to change phantom bodies, go back down three flights of stairs with Phantom Zelda lagging behind, walking at half speed everywhere? And I'm sitting there running into the stairwell and she's wait for me, wait for me, wait for me. Well, then run faster, bitch. Like it's this is one of those things where it is like the Tower of Spirits is inherently hampered by the fact that like, yeah, Zelda's never moving as fast as you are. And that can be annoying. But I don't know. I completely agree with you, Matt. I feel like this. So the amount of floors we played this week probably could have been split up into two weeks worth of stuff. Yes. Agreed. And at the same time, like I'm, I have conflicting feelings about it because I know that the intention was for this to be basically the final dungeon of the game. You know? Yep. And it works better here than Temple of the Ocean King did in Phantom Hourglass because as it's been the whole time. It's, it's better. It's all new. Like yeah. we haven't played these floors before. And so they're inherently more interesting. Right. Yeah. But it, it did just it. It really did feel like it just took forever to get through this. It took a very long time. Um, and I think a lot of that, too, is just the fact that going back to the, the darkness mechanic. Um, I, I really don't like it. It really dominated the front third like, of this whole thing. It didn't overly bother me the first time we did it. It didn't. I didn't love it, but I didn't like hate it. But as soon as we got back into it, it's like it's it's almost like I didn't have any. I didn't recover from the first time, so there was no like rebuilt up grace period. It was just immediately back into like, oh man, here we are again, and then like just downhill from there on yeah. darkness specifically. Sam, what's your favorite phantom to take control of? My favorite phantom. Uh, the wrecking ball guy. Roly poly. Rolly, rolling around, yeah. Yep, 
Yep, that's a good pick. I think that's probably just pure destruction. Yeah. Roly, All good. Roly Poly is the best one. That's my favorite too. Uh, close runner up though is the uh, Warp Phantom. I love being it's able cool. to just draw a line to the little phantom eyes and just like shoop over to them. Swoop. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I do think like really honestly, this this darkness puzzle could have been just used in the week that we did the other one, right? Yeah. Just cut this one out, move it over there, like, or just cut it out entirely. <laughs> I just can't rid of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, but once you get past the darkness portion of Tower of Spirits this week, I, I thought the other one, like the three key doors, right, where you've got to solve the different uh, shoot the light arrows at the different eye switches puzzles and all that. Yeah. Again, really fun, severely hampered by having to go back and forth between floors like traversal is very slow and cumbersome and like going back and forth yeah. between floors. I just, I, I think you could have done away with it. I hate having to move phantom Zelda over the elevated sand. Yeah. Walkways. Mm. Yeah. No, it's like the rooms themselves were really well designed and they were good puzzles and they really made you think about what you were doing. They made you utilize a wide suite of items, a wide suite of skills you've built up over the course of the game. Um, like very well designed, but it just friction points. We talked about it last week with Max friction points of, Traversal in this game is slow. Zelda is slow. Changing phantoms takes forever, and you have to go back up into a different room, change phantoms, then go back down, then a, down a very long hallway to get to the next staircase. And it's just like friction on friction on friction. At some point, like, just start cutting some of these friction points out. You lose nothing. You lose nothing by eliminating the really long hallways. Sure. Well, it, yeah, right. But you, you still have the inherent... Like the, the friction points that are inherent to the game, which is the imprecision of like movement and stuff via yes. the stylus controls, whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. Sam, I mean, how do you how do you feel about the the Zelda buddy system in the Tower of Spirits just sort of generally? Like it's a huge part of this game and it actually recurs for the back hat like the final two boss encounters as well. Yeah. I I don't know if it's just that I'm bad at it, but I think it's it's at least two levels too clunky for what it needs to be. Um, I, and the fights, I'm so bad at even the mini boss fights where you have to control Zelda. I, I can't do it. Like, I don't, I don't know if it's my coordination or what, but like where you have to have Zelda swing and then have Link run back behind and hit the guy. I, I'm not fast enough for that. I don't know what it is. Well, it's tough because it's like there's there's two extra levels of thought that have to go into you deciding to do something and executing on it in this game. Right. Versus if you were just doing it with buttons, you know? Yeah. And I know like I just this week, I have only played the first um, few levels of the Spirit Tower. But even in those levels, like climbing onto Zelda's shield and being, you know, walked around and jumping like I can't tell you how many times I accidentally jumped into lava. It's just a little a little too clunky for what it needs to be. But as a mechanic, if they tweaked it just the right amount, like if Zelda was faster as Phantom, uh, as a Phantom, and if there was maybe um, a level of protection for not accidentally going the wrong way, also maybe if they would let us use a joystick instead of the stylus. <laughs> Give me my joystick <laughs> controls back! Oh my god, I then cannot I'd be wait. Fine with it, but I think it it needs work. Yeah, for sure. The uh, thing I'm most excited about about leaving spirit tracks behind is knowing without a shadow of a doubt, I never have to use the goddamn stylus controls to move my character ever again. And I'm so excited about that. <laughs> it's so, it's so disappointing to me because there are moments in both phantom hourglass and spirit tracks where I do feel like it makes a case for itself as being a good system or at least showing like a glimmer of like, yes, there is some fun to be had doing this. Um, it's just not a net positive, right? Like there's a there's a very good reason that even though the Switch has a, a capacitive multi-touch screen, um, mm -hmm. that they've never done this again, you know? Um, like the, the on, on either the 3DS or the Switch. Like if this was something that was perceived to have been a good idea, then it would have been replicated on at the very least the 3DS, right? Right. Um, 
but it wasn't. And and that's really for the best. I, I, I do think two games is enough. Like we've got more than enough proof that it's just like you can you just feel more proficient and quicker and more precise with your traditional buttons yeah, than you do this whole stylus system. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I do I do think now that we've played our last chunk of the Tower of the Spirits, I do maintain that it is a like you said, Matt, a very well-designed piece of Zelda history, right? Like the Tower of Spirits, I would say, <clears throat> is a is a success in my mind now that we've done all of it. Like it, it did this wonderful thing where it introduced a system that had a lot of legs, right? Uh, exactly two more legs than Link has. Yep. Four, four legs between the both of them. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, and they just expounded on it week after week after week. Like the – the expansion of difficulty from the first time you did it all the way to the end uh, was constant. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I think the, the Tower of Spirits is a net positive for the game. No yeah. doubt. Yeah. Um, I am a little confused about where in the tower we were, though, for these last floors, right? Because, like, their names were, like, floor, you know, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, right? But we weren't going up. Like we we took the stairs down into the tower, so <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Don't question it; it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just I'm choosing to just roll with it. Uh, They're spirit stairs. Spirit stairs. They go definitely. wherever they want. Magic stairs. I like that. Right. Magic stairs are the solution to everything. Um, okay, so moving past the Tower of Spirits, we have the Compass of Light. Now we know how to get into the Dark Realm. Let's talk about the mechanics of all these different boss encounters, starting with the evil trains that you have to to destroy down in the Dark Realm. Sam, uh, how do you how do you feel about this kind of whole encounter? Oh, I'm actually into it. I really like that we get the opportunity to feel powerful and take out the evil trains, you know, the quick choo-choo scenario. I'm into it. I like it. Yeah. Uh, and it's so fun because I just wish that the train had been moving this fast for the whole game. <laughs> the whole right. game. <laughs> <know>. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I, I thought this was a really good section. I I really enjoyed blowing up the armored trains. Um, and I didn't know about the uh, going to plaid speed until you were like, try the train whistle. And I was Burp. This is great. That was that was awesome. That was that was so much fun. So you know what this whole section was? No, tell me. It's Pac Man. No, okay. Yes, I thought about yeah, that. I had the same. Thought. I thought about that the, <laughs> when I very first entered it. I was like, "Am I just playing Pac Man right now?" And I was like, "I'm here for it. It's fine." The exact same thing. Like you, you get one hit KO'd if you get hit, unless you pick up the little glowing thing, and then you're in total aggro mode. But yeah, I, I think just because of that, because of those similarities to Pac-Man, this was like intrinsically just a lot of fun for me. Yeah. And also nostalgically like, fun. Right, right, right. And um, honestly, if it had gone on any longer than it actually did, maybe it would have started to to bug me a bit. Did you get it in your first try? Uh, second. It took me like four or five. So um, my, my first try, I did not realize that um, – blowing the train whistle while you were empowered made you go that fast. Mm. And so uh, getting that information on the second go round really opened this whole thing up and made it a lot easier to deal with. So, yeah, yeah, that's fair. I think it would be nice if they told you about that yeah, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Again, back to what we said last week with Max, there are some things in this game that it's not a lack of, it's just a lack of information. It's not a lack of, training even it's just there's no way to know unless you just accidentally stumble across it and that's not good game design yeah yeah it's bad actually (laughs) in a word yeah (laughs) yeah no i agree um but also i will say i got lucky on the final train like there's one train that will kind of like go through portals and like move around the track the final train no matter which one it is will do that Okay, and I just got lucky like it uh, it was all the way on the other end of the map and I was like, oh, crap, I've got to figure out which portal goes over there. And then it just kind of like shooped itself over to where I was all on its own. So I was like, thank you. Appreciate there you. you. Go. Hey, he had a he had a uh, suicide pact with his other train buddies. So. OK, well, I was <laughs> I was happy <laughs> to want to be around when all the other ones were gone. Exactly. Poor right. Guy. 
It's like, what's the point of living anymore? Um, there was none, and we took we took care of that. We took care of that evil train. <laughs> That's what I say. We had we had no qualms about assisting him in that. Yeah. Uh, so we get through with this encounter, and then it's on to the the train tracks duel with the demon train. Which, okay. Um, <laughs> lot going lot going on here. This is a this was a Star Fox asshole encounter in my mind. Like it really was, yeah. wasn't it? I liked it. Was it, I mean, was it kind of hitting Star Fox vibes for you as well, Sam? Yeah, you know, something about it um, actually was very Splatoon-y for me. Um, the on-rails portion of it. Well, it's literally on-rails, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of levels in Splatoon's solo campaign, in all three Splatoon solo campaign, I believe, that are kind of on-rails shooting at things. And so it was pretty similar to that. Gotcha. Yeah, and I think um, it's fun because there is a little bit of a learning curve to figuring out how to do this section correctly, but it makes it very easy for you to kind of understand what those rules are uh, pretty immediately once you get in there, right? Yeah. Like uh, trying to figure – like trying to uh, – sorry, learning how to look ahead on the track and see like, okay, are there flames on this section of track? Do I need to switch over to this next one? I need to watch out and make sure I don't get hit by the demon train when it slows down or when it starts moving over to another track, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Learning to mm-hmm. look out for like the weak spots on the demon train itself to mm. actually do damage. It's it's like the it's like one of those it's the boss fight in um on the train level in, in Star, Star Fox. Fox. It's yeah. literally that. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. As you were describing it. I'm just sitting there it's like so funny mm. because the the head of the the demon train has total Andros face too. It do it, do, it yeah. does have Andros face. Wow. Okay. I mean, look, it actually like of all of the things that we did in this finale, I think this was probably the most fun in my opinion. Like maybe Pac Man, but I think it just kind of goes downhill after Demon Train fight. I don't know. I'm I'm really between this one and then the next phase where it's you and Phantom Zelda on the <clears> on the <throat> roof of the Demon Train. It took me four freaking ever to figure out what to do in that situation. Oh, well, that's a skill issue, Matt. No, I don't <laughs> think that was a skill issue. I think, again, we're running into the issue of the game not even giving you any hints at all about what you're supposed to be doing. I mean, Sam, if you had to. So we've got four distinct phases, I guess, to this to the final boss. We've got Pac-Man. We've got the Demon Train duel. We've got the roof of the Demon Train. And then we've got Dark Beast Maladus. Which one of those four to you is the most fun? Uh, I want to say Demon Train, but I think it's actually Pac-Man because I think the controls on Demon Train are just a little tough to work with. Yeah. And it's frustrating because I was noticing like there there would be times where I would notice that the train was slowing down, right? Yeah. It's like I knew what was happening. I was like, cool, kick it. I'm going to kick it into <laughs> yeah, the reverse. Yank right? that like, brake, baby. Yank yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. Um, but sometimes it still wouldn't work, right? Like, right. My train wouldn't slow yeah. down as like, as much as it needed to. And as much as I was used to it doing just right. driving around. And, right? and one thing I noticed in both Pac-Man and in Demon Train is – um, you never actually fully come to a stop, even in uh total, even on pause, you're still minutely moving forward. Yeah. Like, I think it probably had something to do with the fact that they added a speed multiplier to the train movement. Uh-huh. Um, it probably did something with the coding of the objects where it, it just had it as a, at a constant progression. Yeah. But- yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but no, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I do agree with you, Sam. Like there was, uh, there's, I mean, there's clunk throughout this game, right? Um, and uh, there was definitely some clunk involved in the demon train fight as well. But just in terms of like a setting, you know, uh, there's so much clunk in this game. It's like a tree fell over on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. It's still not as clunky as Phantom Hourglass. Like Phantom Hourglass didn't uh, crash. Well, you know what? I, I say that Phantom, Phantom Hourglass, Hourglass never crashed on you. Phantom, yeah, that's true. That's true. I uh, I my 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 total number of game breaking crashes in Spirit Tracks is uh, four at the end of my wow. Playthrough. Yeah. I I only had two. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I've had any. Oh, well, maybe I did thirteen years ago, and I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I I only had two. Luckily, I did not have one during the final boss fights. 
Um, otherwise, that would not be good. I <laughs> probably wouldn't have beaten the game. Guess who honest. dissed? Yeah. Well, okay. So, oh no. I know it's. Is it later or is it here? Um. So. Mine was so just yeah, say later mine, here. Mine was later. Later, was later. okay. Yeah. We'll get to it later. Yeah, okay. Then. So, but anyway, uh, so Demon Train encounter, lots of fun. Setting looks great. I'm curious why in the Dark Realm there's a section of train track where it has just four completely parallel, very long stretches of of train track. Hey, Demon like Train's got to have a runway, man. He's got to okay. get Charlie the Choo Choo <laughs> on one side, Blaine on the other side, and they got to get their evil trains all going in one direction. Okay, sure. It's so their switching not? yard. It's like a drag strip. Uh, drag strip for right. trains. It's a drag drag strip for the evil trains yeah cool there you go it <laughs> makes sense now fun, actually there should be drag strips for trains but <laughs> that actually <laughs> would be kind of cool <laughs> honestly we uh, can talk about that with whoever makes trains in the future yeah it out. i was gonna say you need to uh squirrel some money away sam and just like fire that up as like a whole hobby like subcategory you know <laughs> you could charge a <laughs> lot of money for racing. those tickets train racing exactly. because look there there has to be an end to the tracks so if they don't break in time they derail and then it's a real mess but i mean oh, for the tickets to watch yeah like exactly people. yeah tickets i was to watch. thinking like tickets for people who want to be on the train oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> no that it says this is not a ride that. along train <laughs> no it's a spectator sport spectator yeah. sport i mean for formula sure. one is huge right now right so there train, is, yeah. train drag racing why not <laughs> yeah <laughs> that sounds pretty fun I'd watch all it. right this is a good idea Mark it down for later. We'll jot it down. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we're done train drag racing now. Um, And uh, we're on to the next encounter, which is Phantom Zelda and Link hopping onto the roof of the demon train. Um, The fun little interstitial cutscene here, right? This is the one you were talking about earlier, Sam, where you have your little powwow with Angine and uh, Burn, and you're trying to decide who's going to get up on the roof and go take care of business. Um, Yep. And so uh, th- there's a fun cutscene here where Link and Zelda are kind of like crawling up onto the roof. Yeah, I, I liked that. Yeah. I liked that. Um, it, it was definitely it was good times. Uh, Sam, how do you feel about this encounter? Because it's it's very different. Uh, like we, we have officially moved out of the vehicle combat phase of the final boss fight at this point. Yeah, um, I think it's it's fine as like a stage in a boss fight. But this is like when I was saying I thought. Cole was just annoying. This is where he's peak annoying in this this little fight. Uh, it's just like, I don't know. Here's a bunch of things that you have to overcome just to like get to the end of this train. It's just kind of an unnecessary addition that doesn't add too much to the overall boss fight. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely kind of like the... Uh, it, it's definitely the the middle portion, I guess. You yeah. Know? Um, it's kind of like it, it. You definitely get the sense and the feeling that there's a bigger thing happening after what you're doing right now, and you just have to get through it in order to get there. Um, I do think that there's something fun here. Like I, I appreciate that they found a way to get Zelda Phantom Buddy mechanics into the final fight. Yeah. And as soon, as soon as I figured out that you're basically just supposed to use Zelda as a human shield to get yourself to the end of the train. (laughs) That's why I didn't get it immediately. I was like, I feel like Zelda is not the one that should be in danger. Like we're trying to get her body back. Um, So, look, I I, the best part about this whole thing to me was the fact that Phantom Zelda straight up just bear hugs and like arm wrestles with Maladus in her body. Like, that's got to be a mind, (laughs) right? Like you're you're wrestling your own body when it's possessed by an evil demon. Oh, no doubt. Like, Mm -hmm. I I thought that was really funny. And then just the fact that Cole is in the background floating behind them, just like, He's doing like the old maid <laughs> screechy hands, like oh my, oh my god! The return of evil jazz hands. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's doing evil jazz hands in the back, um, and then Zelda's like, "Shoot my body!" I'm like, "Are you sure? Right. You sure you yeah. want me to shoot your body with an arrow? I feel like it's probably not good for it." I don't know, man. There's just a lot of goofy shit that happens in this game. But you're totally right, Sam, right? Like, I mean, Cole is an annoying character, and he spends this entire encounter just being a huge pain in the butt. And doing Mario noises the whole time. (laughs) Uh, He does, doesn't he? He's he's very Mario. Yeah. Um, But it's like, honestly, like the whole, if there was just a slightly longer gap between him shooting electric mice at Zelda, then this would have been a lot less of a pain in the ass than it actually was, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
But yeah, it's just it's 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 a lot of things to manage and you have to be really quick and precise with your sword motions in order to clear out all the mice so that you don't get Zelda possessed and then you get knocked further back down the train. Right. But now we're back to the fact that the stylus controls don't really afford you that level of speed and quick precision that you need in order to easily do that. Yeah, it would be nice, honestly, if they had tagged the right bumper to be able to toggle between you and Zelda and and the left bumper for your items, because that was my biggest pain point was trying to move back and forth between who I'm having move. And I would constantly be trying to like and I had this problem the entire game. It's just more noticeable here when you're trying to do it under a uh, time crunch i would try to move zelda's little cursor her little pink bubble and i would just accidentally swipe instead and then link would move forward and get shot by maladus and i'm like no stop it and uh yeah that, that just kept happening over and over again so i wish there would have been a, a more fluid yeah. um way to switch between which character you're moving I got really close to dying here several times because I did die here. Okay. I had to use a purple potion. So Maladus's laser beam does a lot of damage and uh, possessed Phantom Zelda also does a lot of damage. Lots of damage. Yeah. Yeah. And it took me a a longer than it should have to realize that I should just use the boomerang to cut the strings whenever she gets possessed. Now, that is a skill issue. That is a total skill issue. Yes, (laughs) I I kept trying to go around her and cut it with a sword because the first two times it happened, I was already behind her anyway. So I didn't know that you could use anything else. So so I, I thought you had to use the sword. Yeah, that's on you, boo. This game has given you plenty of ways to know that that's kind of what you were supposed to do. Hey, look, I'm not (laughs) saying this particular point is not a me problem. I'm just saying it was still a problem. Although, I I will say that one thing that this game really does not do in the final boss fight is, like, give you any reason to use the vast majority of the tools that you've collected. Almost no item except for the light arrows and your sword. And, and I, I would really have appreciated being something like maybe that phase of the fight was like a longer portion of the train where you're going through different sections that use that that call back to the um, previous boss battles or something like that. And they could have done something. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely, Sam. Um, and you know what we never talked about? What? The fact that we just get given this game's sacred sword in a <laughs> cutscene. Oh my gosh, you're right. We never even touched on that. We it go, was never even mentioned. Like the we, fact that a locomo sword was a thing that exists was never mentioned. Never mentioned. And we haven't talked about it in the episode up to this point because it was so like just glossed over. <laughs> but just like you go from training sword to locomo sword. Boom. <laughs> like, okay, cool. Thanks for like teleporting that out of the ether, Angene. Appreciate you. Right. Could you have done that maybe at the beginning of the game? Yeah, this whole thing is like, Angie, I feel like you really could have been doing a lot more for me throughout this entire (laughs) experience. You can obviously teleport us places. Can you like make use of that? Giving out sacred swords like it's candy. So like the caramels that you have in your purse because you're an old woman. Like, come on. (laughs) I'll take that magic sword. The extra the moves on the sword. I, I, I'm assuming that you guys didn't get. Um. Because one of them is from collecting all 50 bunnies. That's how you get your little shooty beams from your sword. No way in hell I got uh, that. Absolutely <laughs> not. Nope. And and then you there's also a powered up spin move, oh, which that, is from that getting have, all 20 stamps, I believe. That would have been very helpful against all of those boulders that Maladus throws at Zelda. Yes. Absolutely. Well... When I never, ever play this game ever again, I'll be sure to get all of those things. <laughs> hey, you know what? I... I you won't still, play it again. I still think it's incredibly unlikely that this game ever gets a remaster uh, and is ported to like a better piece of hardware. Oh, it would have to be a, it, a big remaster. Yeah, ground. <laughs> it'd be a ground up rework. Yeah. And there's no way like somebody's already crunched the numbers on that, I'm sure, and decided that in no world is that profitable for uh, for Nintendo to do. But uh, look, if, if it ever does happen. And it seems like it's legitimately just a better gameplay experience, then I will happily go back and play Spirit Tracks again. But you're right. I'm not. There's no world that I can 
envision in which I fire up my 3DS and pop in the cartridge and play it again exactly the same way that I'm no, it's never know, happening. Yeah, it's, I'm not doing it. I'm more likely to play Adventure of Link again before I play this game or Me too, Phantom actually. Hourglass. Me too. Yeah. Yep. I think that's right. Um, but anyway, yeah. So this is all this is all a very strange turn of events. The Locomo Sword itself looks cool. It looks exactly like the Phantom Sword. Uh, not exactly. There's subtle differences, Matt. Like what? The hilt. There's like a pattern on the yeah. blade, isn't there? There is, yeah. I don't know, shapes or something. I don't remember the Phantom Sword well enough <laughs> to make a bold statement like that, well, but I thing, did. The Phantom so Sword has, had the Phantom Hourglass yeah. in it. This one had a Forge Gem. But like other than that, they look basically the same. The so the um the little the hand guards on the locomo sword they're the pedestal right well they're the same as like the warp gates like they're the yeah they're they've the got Zelda the little flanges shape it's sort yeah. of like a Hylian bird a yeah beetle. yeah exactly yeah. okay um and the phantom sword is not that I don't know they look different go okay fine you, you go look at them fine yeah. <laughs> maybe later <laughs> okay I don't care enough about this game or the sword <laughs> to actually do that. Uh, it doesn't seem very important to <laughs> anything in the future or past. So I would, probably say, okay. I would say that's probably correct. So, um, okay. Anyway, but I, okay. So, uh, putting a pin in the top of the train car, uh, boss encounter here. Um, I actually, you know, even though it had a little bit of clunk and Cole is annoying, I did really like this whole thing. To me, this was like the, the finale of mission impossible on top of a train yeah. In Zelda, oh, right? that's a good that's a good comparison. That's that makes funny. it a lot more fun. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So um, I, I, I enjoyed it. Right. Um, I, I will admit that it took me a minute to figure out exactly what I was supposed to do with the whole shooting Zelda's body with the light arrow at the end. Right. Because it shifts very abruptly to like showing that situation on the top screen while mm-hmm. you're on the bottom screen. And mm-hmm. I'm just sitting here like, how do these angles how, line how are we, how are we working here. this up yeah you know yep um, did you know apparently if you don't shoot it her body fast enough uh you will have to redo the whole thing the oh whole my thing. god am i glad i didn't have to do that <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know that but in the video that i was watching today confirmed it ah, okay fair enough well consider that a bullet dodged um yes a bullet train uh, because, uh, yeah, I would have enjoyed absolutely none of that. I enjoyed doing this one time, right? Having to yep. start it all the way over from the beginning would not have been great, but no doubt. Anyway, so uh, we blow up the demon train and we get shooped back into the overworld, I guess. I don't know exactly where we are, um, but uh, now it's time to do battle with actual Maladus, right? Um, you know, uh, Maladus coal fusion, you know, Maladus is <clears throat> big and Coletus? head. What? Colitis? Yes. It sounds like a disease. It does. Col- <laughs> colitis. <laughs> colitis. Hey, that's a real thing. That yeah. is. That yeah. is a disease. We're going to call him colitis. Uh-huh. So um, anyway, so colitis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sticking. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Maladus's giant Andros head chews up coal and they become dark beast Maladus with uh, the aforementioned ginger Wario mustache, right? Um and so this kicks off the final phase of the boss fight. Um, this is where my game crashed. I got. Uh, um, I mean, that's uh, that's no. yeah. It's so not horrible. Well, the 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 nice thing is there is a save that the game makes you do right before you right get on the tr- all this. Yeah, right. So uh, when my game crashed in here, I did not have to redo Pac Man. Okay. Uh, so which was good, and I did not have to redo the Demon Train fight. Right. You just had to redo top of the train, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. That's not in grand scheme of things horrible. It took me five minutes the yeah. second time I had to do it. Once like, you once you know what you're doing, it's not that bad. Yeah. Um still a pain. Like it's a Zelda game. It shouldn't be crashing. Yeah. You know? I can I can forgive Destiny when Destiny crashes because I expect that from Destiny. God, can I, you go say that boldly and loudly on Twitter somewhere for me, please? Sure. Um Thank I you. I do not forgive Zelda games when they crash because they have given me 30 years of experience that that should never happen. So like, yeah, I just, I just don't get it. Have you, Sam, have you ever had an experience with a, a Zelda game, a first party Zelda game where it just crashed and like bricked your system? Like hard. Yeah, I'm really thinking. And I don't, I don't think I have, if I have, it probably would have been one of the N64 ones. Those uh, those did N64. freeze up but occasionally. My N64, like if you accidentally poked it with your toe, it would 
break. So. Yeah, that, that was a system issue more than a game yeah. issue, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But I don't. I I have grown to trust my Zelda games as well, so I don't think so. Yeah, it was it was disappointing, and it was it was definitely salt in the wound of like the fact that I like I don't know I was coming off of this three hour chunk of the Tower of Spirits right. And then going through this whole extended final boss fight and then to have a game crash in the middle of all that and to lose even more time, you know, it was just it was a pain. Um, But anyway, get back in here, Matt. How do you feel about this final uh, phase of the fight versus Dark Beast Maladus? Uh, Everything from the defending Zelda all the way to the distracting Maladus so that she can shoot his back with a light arrow. (coughs) How do you feel about this fight? Um. The first phase of this fight where he's just throwing or he's he's coughing up volatile hairballs <laughs> at you. Chris. He literally sounds like your cat. Nasty. He sounds like Mal when Mal's calf coughing up a hairball. Yep. Um, and he even does the same body motions like it's the full like uh, back arch and the, you know, moves his head in that way. <laughs> like it's literally looks like an animation of a cat coughing up a hairball. Do you have cats, Sam? Uh, my parents have cats that I consider my cats. Okay, so there you go. Fair, yeah. yes. We're we're all on a page with yeah. what this looks like <laughs> yeah. right now. Yeah. So yes. um, that part was the least fun part of any boss fight that I can currently remember in a Zelda game. The having to deflect all yes. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I'm not saying that like that is true. Like, I'm just saying in this moment, I cannot think of any mechanic in a boss fight in any Zelda game that I have ever played that I enjoyed less than that. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I, if it was doing something other than just like hitting the hitting the boss to the side, like if you're hitting them back at him, I think I would feel OK with it. But yeah. Yeah, it's it's but like you're totally right. Like we're literally just deflecting them off into nowhere instead of doing a dead man's volley. And Dead Man's Volley would have at least made sense. And it also, like, it's not fun. And it lasts forever. It is so long. It takes a really, really, really long time. And uh, you have to be, like, there is no margin for error at all. One hit to Zelda, insta-fails the whole thing. And, yeah, this took me 30 minutes. To get through this yeah, section. It, it probably at least that I'm much. just doing the same thing over and over and over and over. And like finally I just managed to get it absolutely perfect. But um, it's not even that hard necessarily. It's just once you get to the – so I, I kept getting tricked up on the very final one where he fires two waves of four rocks at a time, right? Yeah. Because you basically have to do two spin attacks back to back. But doing two spin attacks in rapid succession with the stylus controls on this game – is so hard it's yeah. so hard like man it, the 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 combat touch controls really failed me oh here. my gosh they're like, really bad the, there was there's a level of precision that you need in order for an encounter like this to be fun and spirit tracks doesn't have it yeah absolutely there were more there was like three four five times where it got to the point where you have to spin attack to hit the four that he shoots at one time that i'm sitting there drawing circles drawing circles and links just literally moving in a circle and right. i'm like what are you <laughs> yeah. doing like come on no it, it it is it was infuriating to be honest my my dog was in my office with me as i was doing this and i got so frustrated he like scampered out of the room and looked at me and I felt really bad. I was like, I'm sorry. I'm not mad at you. You're fine. (laughs) You're perfect. You're just this beautiful little sensitive child. And I love you so much. Um, I'm going to close this office door. So you don't feel like I'm yelling. My rage. Yeah. So I don't feel like, so you don't feel like I'm yelling at you anymore. (laughs) There you go. That was considerate of you. Yeah. Yeah. We we made up later. I gave him a treat. It was all fine. Okay, um, cool. That's good. Yeah. Sam, how do you feel about this final boss fight? I think it's just like it's such a predictable, simple mechanic is the kind of thing that you would expect in like the first boss fight of a game. Um, There's no reason to even have it now, let alone like this weird extended version of the mechanic. I will say 
I think that both of you would have had a much better time if you collected all the stamps. You would have uh, had that powered up spin attack. That's true. Nice. Yeah, that's that's fair. I I completely agree with you. That probably <laughs> would have made this a lot more fun. I don't know if it would have made it enough of a better time for me to justify the offset of having spent all that extra time collecting the stamps. No, it still shouldn't have been. I, it, it just should not have been part of that fight or it should have been tweaked in some way or like, I don't know. This would have been a good opportunity to pull in something where you can use like the boomerang, have him spit out four things that you have to boomerang all at once or something like that. Yeah. Or any other item. Again, I think it's such a missed opportunity that the items barely come into play in this final boss fight. Yeah, I mean having having options for how you can how, how you can choose to tackle this really yeah. would have helped elevate it, I think. Um I'm in total agreement with you there. Um but yeah, I mean I, I finally got it uh and it was just it was so frustrating. Um but you know, the only thing that could make this entire experience better, Matt, uh using the goddamn flute it's a flute duet with zelda <laughs> in the middle of the fight i love the duet that's my favorite part oh sam please please uh, hold on hold on hold <laughs> no, on hold please on, hold expound on, hold on, hold on. i'm asking her to expound okay please okay. expound i need you to explain which part the fact that you like this at all just oh <laughs> i love it oh, okay yes just so. go Instrument mechanics in Zelda games. Obsessed. Love it. I like having the flute, my little spirit flute, pan flute, um, as an option. I think the novelty of the microphone is cool. I think this particular song is pretty hard to play because you have to, you can't just like blow into the microphone for five seconds. But all the same, it makes such a nice tune. And then all the locomo come in and play with you. And it's a little bit like Link's Awakening with all the instruments. It's beautiful. So there's two things happening here for me. One is, yes, this actual piece of music is, is really good. Great. I really, really like the music that comes out of it's it. It's awesome. And yes, <laughs> and like the cutscene and everything, like exactly. Honestly enjoyed it. Exactly what you're saying, Sam. Like when the locomo come in, it's a great moment. It's a cool culmination of like characters that we've been meeting throughout the entire course of the game. Awesome. No problems with it. It's just, uh, you know, this stupid microphone flute mechanic <laughs> has, it, it, it has just not gotten any more fun for me. As we've gone through the game and uh, the more complex that the songs get, the more that I seem to end up like banging my head up against trying to play them correctly. Um, And I don't know, like, how hard can it be? I know where the microphone is on my 3DS. You know, I'm blowing into it. It just like it will all of a sudden stop working at times. Did you guys have the problem where your hand, your like stylus hand is blocking the microphone? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And also, I should add just a reminder, I didn't play this portion of the game this week. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the, the fresh wound right now. That's I just watched it on YouTube. So. That's fair. That's but fair. I will say this took me a lot less time than last week's duet. But the, I think I, I think my game was having oh, a problem I mean, this last only, week. This only took me like five tries. Yeah, yeah. same. It, I feel like it was more forgiving, honestly, because of all the skipping around you had to do. Um Last week, I think my game was just having some kind of an issue. But anyway, um, it took me five ish times to get it right. I thought it was funny that Zelda got increasingly more agitated with you the more often you failed. Like eventually she (laughs) says, get it together, Link. Like literally. And I was like, that is honestly hilarious. It would be like, you try blowing into this microphone, Zelda. (laughs) Seriously. Like I'm pretty sure. All you're doing is humming. (laughs) I'm over here like I'm at my desk about to throw my And I'm like, I'm I'm like like, hunched over like. (laughs) 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 I just sitting here like, I'm pretty sure that I kind of, I I could have already played this on an actual pan flute. I absolutely could have played this on a recorder (laughs) at least. I I still could probably play hot cross buns on the recorder, man. Uh, I could have done this. But uh, but the music is actually really great. I mean, and Sam, this has been kind of a recurring point of feedback throughout the whole season. We l- we've loved these locomo duets just for like, the way they sound. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Um, so uh, 
definitely another really great one here. But yeah, I, I, I thought it was just so hysterical. Like Zelda shoops you into like a sacred realm, basically. <laughs> just It looks like the, um, I don't remember what it is, that level that's in all of the Smash Bros with like the pretty fountains. You know what I'm talking about? I do know what you're talking about, That's yes. what it looks like. Yeah, it, I, I know what you're talking about. I don't know what it's called, Beautiful. but it's like, I think it's literally called like stage A, B, or C. It's like one of the generic <laughs> stages, Probably. but yes. This is fun too, because it's one of those, like, especially in, in the Zelda timelines where you get further and further away from anything having to actually do with the Triforce. It opens up possibilities. Right, like you still, you have these situations where Zelda just has this sort of nebulous mystical power yeah and you kind of know where it comes from you know but the game doesn't really explain it or talk about it at all so um i like it because i understand it you know yes but agreed um anyway so Mm -hmm. we get done with the flute and then we get into the final phase of this boss fight here which is uh very very similar like we were saying earlier to the final phase of dark beast ganon in breath of the wild right yep doing anything for you matt I, i like it was fine um it was it was better than the previous phase. Not as good as Demon Train. Um, not as good as Pac-Man. Like, it was fine-ish. Um, it was not hard. I, I do appreciate... I didn't even move Zelda at all. I just left her stationary and moved Link around the platform. Me too. To, to get Maladus where I needed him to be. I appreciated that there was a little reticle that changed color on the top screen whenever Zelda was able to shoot Maladus. So that made it a lot easier. Instead of having to do like guesswork about it, so yeah, I mean, like it was, it was fine. Um, the the ending part is what really <laughs> got to me. It's like rub 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 real fast. <laughs> I had thoughts about that. It wanted you to rub it again, Matt. Yeah, we're not. This is a rated E podcast. I was just like, rated e for I was everyone. worried that I was going to break my touch screen. So was I. Like, I was like, I'm definitely like, I'm going to go through the screen at some point or my stylus is going to rub into the whatever film is on it and it's going to scratch it up. Like, yeah, it was like not, this is going to be the end of my my Majora's Mask yeah. special edition 3DS XL. And there is no less worthy game to sacrifice that <laughs> 3DS on than this one. <laughs> Oh, uh, you're so right. Um, how about you, Sam? I mean, uh, you know, is 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 this doing anything for you just like as a concept, this whole last phase I of the mean, fight? I it, mean, it's kind of classic Zelda feeling. It's better than, than the previous phase. Um, I did like in this portion where you had kind of the, the top screen perspective from Zelda and the bottom screen perspective from Link. I thought that was cute. So I like that. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think it was a good use of that technology, and I still feel like Spirit Tracks has not leveraged that whole top to bottom screen situation as well as Phantom Hourglass did for a lot of its boss fights, um, for whatever reason. But this this was a pretty good use of it for sure. Um, the one thing, so I guess to put a pin in this whole situation for me, the one thing that I kind of came away from with Dark Beast Maladus, like the big final boss encounter. Um, I was sort of feeling like it was all a little arcadey, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, no, I, 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 that does make sense, yes. Where it's like, in a lot of other Zelda games, final boss fight, you're just like, you're doing sword combat, basically, right? And you've just got to be quick and dodge attacks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, both phases of Dark Beast Maladus really felt, yeah, just very, much more like set pieces, I guess, than actual fights with a character. Yeah. So... No, that's uh, that's fair. Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that that pretty much wraps us up for part three. Do we have anything else we want to say just uh, to to put a pin in this whole final boss fight of the game discussion? Sam, Matt. God, I'm glad it's over. I forgot. There's also the part where Zelda does directly ask for help from Tetra, which I oh, thought. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Was weird. Because I don't know how she made that jump, but uh, what, but I guess the nod was nice. <laughs> we're we're going to accept the reference because it was fun and <laughs> not because fine. it made any yeah. sense whatsoever. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I kind of enjoyed that as well and had a similar thought of like, wait, I didn't know you knew who that was, but I guess it makes sense. Like it's her ancestor, her grandmother or great grandmother. So I 
yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I'm choosing to appreciate it. I'm going to choose happiness here and appreciate it for what it was. Um, let's go ahead and get into part four, which is bloopy trails, where we talk about interesting things that diverted our attention this week. This is probably going to be a real quick one for you and I, Matt. Sam, I'm going to let you go first. And because this is your first appearance on the season, you basically just get to tell us your favorite side quest in this whole game. Oh, boy. Uh, well, okay. First, I want to say my least favorite side quest, which is anything where you have to um, bring people around on your train and make them happy because they want you to follow the signs on the train tracks hate or whatever. It. hate it so much. I don't understand. Why do they care? I'm going to get you where you need to go. Just let me do it. Whatever. So I don't like that. My favorite, I'm going to go bunnies. Okay. I think I think it's nice that they're just kind of around. Um, I think it would be nice if they introduced them to you even earlier in the game, so you don't have to backtrack at all. That would be really cool. But sure, um, you get good rewards for it. At least a couple good rewards for it. So it's cute. You can go visit your bunnies. There's a guy that's dressed like a rabbit. I'll take it. Yeah, I mean they're adorable, which doesn't hurt, right? Um, right. And also, yeah, the Rabbit Land Rescue guy is uh, definitely up. I mean, like a very classic feeling, uh, weird Zelda NPC, right? Yeah. Yeah. A um, lot of personality. Love the Rabbit Land Rescue guy. Um, uh, it's totally a good point, though, like about wishing that uh, this had been a system that was accessible a little bit earlier, right? I mean, because like gold sculptures are kind of a good analog for this in Ocarina of Time. Um and you can start collecting gold sculptula tokens long before you get to the actual house in Kakariko Village. Um, mm-hmm. And Ocarina of Time came out in 1998, right? <laughs> so it's like <laughs> way before this game. Um, and so it's kind of makes you wonder. It's like, why didn't you? Why didn't you think to give me a way to collect bunnies before I actually, you know, get halfway through the game or whatever? But um, yeah, it's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, for me, like like we were saying earlier, Matt and I just did not get into too much side quest stuff in this game because nothing the amount of the amount of time that it took to go and seek that out versus how much time it takes you to do that in a, in any other Zelda game um was just too much and it it just didn't sound like fun um we both you, did did you I have a question for you did yeah. you upgrade your train at all no I did right before I went into the final boss fight. I saved up my treasure from the last like four or five, the last like three episodes. I say I haven't sold any of my treasure. So So probably got that that line back. So many rupees in there. Uh, Yeah. Rupees. And you could probably fully upgrade your train. So I saved my my treasure from the last like three episodes, went to line back and upgraded every part of my train. And like, granted it was all different parts because I couldn't afford most of them. Um, most of them like out of the same set. Yeah. And it got me one extra train heart. And I walked <laughs> out of that going, that was the most useless piece of shit I've ever done. Like I was so annoyed. But di- how'd your train look? Horrible. Cause I, I only <laughs> did, did it. Fast. Yeah. I only did it to try to get the extra health points and I got one extra heart out of it. And I'm like, I'm done. Nah. I looked that up actually. I just today I looked up like what the upgrades were and you get two extra hearts. If you're, parts match so you don't even get like one per part or anything like that the only exception is if you go for the gold the full gold set you get i think eight total hearts instead of six max wow they really that's a missed opportunity they should have had like one set that makes you go faster one set Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i don't know Double cannons or something like that. Yeah, I totally agree. Could we have had a swift sail for this train? Like, oh, that's all I want, man. It doesn't even it doesn't even have to be like super wheels or anything like that. Just give me the swift sail. Just let me (laughs) stick the swift sail on the top of the train. Put it on the top. It's fine. Yeah, then you just go faster. Um, No, yeah, I didn't mess around with any of that. Um, My big thing was I did kind of like I was collecting bunnies wherever I would see them the whole time I was playing the game. That's just because so, Bony Friend. Yeah, sure. And I, I never went out of my way to go return them to the Rabbit Land Rescue, but before, I actually think I still have them all on my train. So b- <laughs> before I went to the Dark Realm, because I didn't want to subject these poor innocent bunnies to whatever evil nonsense was happening in the in the netherworld, right? Uh, they don't deserve that. So I took, I took the bunnies back to Rabbit Land Rescue, and I had enough to get a new piece of heart. <clears throat> 
And what else did I get? Oh, a go- uh, a piece of gold. Ancient gold. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's worth 500 rupees at linebacker. I think I had like 15 bunnies. Um, I did have bunnies from every region. So. Yeah. I did too. Yeah. I still do, actually. They're so, hanging out on my train. Anyway. So yeah, I saved bunnies and I feel good about that. That's about my hey, there you go. I like to believe that my bunnies are uh f- frolicking in the passenger car, just enjoying their vacation. Yeah. They're getting to see the world. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and get into part five, which is Z targeting, where we lock on to fascinating characters or enemies that we happen to cross. It's the last episode of the main part of the season, Matt, which means that yeah, it's time to uh, it's time to blow Z targeting on some of the big name characters that we only are allowed to use once per season. Zelda, I call it. I'm doing Zelda too. I mean, come oh, okay, on. Zelda. So we're both doing Zelda. Yeah, right. Zelda's can I Zelda's do awesome. Zelda too? You can yes, do Zelda. Absolutely. We're three, three for three on Zelda. This Zelda is worth a three for three. She's she's good. I I think that she has personality. She's got a little bit of that Tetra spunk that I like. She's got things to do. Things to do. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Like man, I I just really appreciated having. Zelda as the companion character. I thought that was novel. I thought it was good. I thought it was well executed. The phantom sections for the most part were fun. Like they gave her things to do that were meaningful and good and well designed and well thought out. Her dialogue was, was good all the way around. Um, like really, really, really was probably the best part of the entire game. Sam, uh, why don't you go ahead and let us know how you feel about Spirit Tracks version of Zelda? Uh, pretty much all the same. I just, she has probably more personality than even our Tetra Zelda in Wind Waker. Her, between like being afraid of small creatures, you know, rodents and bugs, and um, her true motivation to not see her body be put to poor use and... Um, she's got like the hustle. She's got the drive. She's just, she has a real personality, which she doesn't always get to have. So mm. very pro spirit track Zelda. Mm. Yeah. I, I think you were really onto something here too, Matt. I mean, the, the reason I love this version of Zelda so much is that she has got equal parts Tetra and also classic Zelda, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Tetra was kind of like all spunk all the time, you yep. know? This Zelda has shades of that, but mixes it in with a little bit with with other stuff. Like it's she is not a carbon copy of Tetra in right. this game. She's not she's not Tetra Junior. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it just makes for a really great character. And she has some great moments in the back half of this game, right? Yeah. Like obviously, Sam, you're totally right. Like it's been kind of a running joke, honestly, in the throughout the entire game, right? Where it's like Zelda's helping you, but also like she'll kind of like talk out of the side of her mouth about like, but really, like, can we? please keep my body safe or whatever. Right. (laughs) Totally understandable. Um, but there's a lot of fun moments this week where it's like her body is in physical danger and she's still concerned about that. Right. But also willing to just kind of like be in there and willing to accept the danger, you know, for the purposes of like defeating this huge evil beast person. So, um, yeah, a lot of, lot of great moments for, for Zelda this week. I loved the moment at the end of going in. So going into the, the final boss fight after birth, has his big sacrifice um zelda turns on her heel and there's like tears that kind of fly off her face yep yep yeah i remember that really cool framed moment like i mm, think there's also i think at least two that i know of moments in the game that that really showcase that zelda genuinely feels friendship towards link like feels tied to him and I really like that they have that really random moment in the train right before they go for the boss. Uh, I think right before they climb up to the top of the train um, where she asks, like, what are you going to do? And we're all done with this. Do you want to be a warrior or an engineer or you don't know? Something like that. I thought that was cute. Yeah. Yep. Completely agree. Um, It's all layers on top of like a really well portrayed relationship. So, yeah, I I, absolutely. Um, well, there we go. We have a we have a triple play here. Uh, I think this might be the first time the in first the first time we've ever Realms. done a triple play. She's that, that good. Yeah, yeah, cool. 
Spirit Track Zelda, you were a, a true winner. All right, uh, let's get in then to part six, which is our final thoughts in which we let Matt wrap up this section of the game in as succinct a way as he can think to do. We close out our times with Spirit Tracks, ready to debark this train and start a new journey somewhere else. Uh, we enjoy uh, our time uh, getting to the Dark Realm after a very, 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 very lengthy stay in the Tower of Spirits. Uh, we get to see a little more shades of character from Angine and Burn, uh, and then we get to embark upon a really fun game of Pac-Man, and then chase the train in a Star Fox style shootout with the Demon Train, culminating in a three-phase boss fight against the big bad of the game, Malice. Uh, four, if you count Pac-Man. Four, I'm not counting Pac-Man. Okay. Uh, three-phase boss fight against the big bad of the game, Maladus. We close out the the game as most Zelda games close out with defeating the big bad and setting Hyrule back to its normal uh, course of events as we say goodbye to our Locomo friends as they ascend back into the heavens uh, all in all closing out this uh, game on not a great note with the the bosses and the encounters that we had but um, it was certainly a time well done as always matt that brings us to the end of the sacred realms rundown for this week we will be back with another installment of the sacred realms rundown not next week because next week we have a rank and recap to take care of we do so you will have a poll to vote on what game we play next your choices are all good ones all the way down ocarina of time redux and majora's mask are the only two that are going to be up there this time oracle double feature no we can't do three oh, can't we can't do can't four do top, top downs. downs in a row you're right it would be four we can't do four top yeah, downs okay, in a row. Right. So your your only two options this time are going to be Ocarina of Time, Master Quest, Redux, or Majora's Mask. Man, I have to play. I have to play either Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask. Oh darn! However, will I survive? What a shame. <laughs> Golly, it's going to be fun. Okay. Um, looking forward to those. Either one, uh, honestly, can't go wrong. So very excited. Absolutely. To get back into that. You know what? One good thing about uh, the Master Quest. What? I can reuse all the plot recaps. <laughs> no, you have to redo the plot recaps. <laughs> Let's be real. That first season plot recap situation, it, it's, it's come it's, a long way, buddy. It's, it, it's grown. It's yeah. grown. Okay. We will definitely redo episode one because we didn't have a written plot recap for episode We're one. We're going to redo all of them. <sighs> You're just really making me do more work. Linda. I am. I am going to make you do more work. All right. Yes. Fine, fine, yes, fine. Yes, yes. Sam, we really appreciate you coming back on the show this week. And, uh, you know, thanks for giving us your honest thoughts about Spirit Tracks. I know that Matt and I were definitely kind of playing the Debbie Downers to your much more kind of like rosy positive attitude toward this game. And I uh, I hope we didn't come across as being unfairly negative towards it. No, no. Thanks for having me. I I'm always happy to talk about Zelda. And there are very few. In fact, the only Zelda game that I straight up do not like is Zelda 2. So it's hard to hard to get me to be mean about any Zelda game, I guess. Fair enough. I think that's a fair stance to take. Where it hurts at? Josh's heart, but it's fair. Yeah, Josh does love <laughs> Zelda 2. Uh, where are you at with Majora's Mask, Sam? Actually, we have a lot of people on our Discord that love Zelda 2. Yeah, they do. Which is weird. They do. They do. Anyway, that is sorry. weird. I don't accept it. Um, <laughs> no, Majora's Mask I love. I... Did not play Majora's Mask when it came out. I played it and beat it for the first time with my best friend. I have good, um, a good association, good memory with with beating it for the first time. I want to say in like maybe 2011, 2012. Um, but then I didn't go back to 100% it. Or to, you know, get all the masks, I should say, until it was out on the 3DS. So um, I've now played it a few times. I, I want to say three or four times. So I, I like Majora's Mask a lot. It's so funny because Majora's Mask to me was my big intro to the online Zelda fan community. Mm. Um, via Dude, the you remember getting dad to download the game? Game Rant. I don't know if it was Game Rant at the time, but he downloaded like 
guides for us and oh, printed them yeah. at work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For, and I we do. started that with Majora's Mask. Uh-huh. And then we just like printed them off at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I, I'm, I'm talking more about like the the YouTube Zelda online community. Oh, like, really? And that all that all started with because uh, I did all that art for Operation Moonfall. Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. I have your art on my refrigerator still. I, ha- I have your art as well. You do. Um, and actually, that was what led me to your content for the very first time, Sam. Like I was doing a deep dive into like, what's the Zelda fan community like on on the Internet? <laughs> and uh, and here we go. With Nintendo fangirl. I was like, OK, cool. This and seems- hey, look, like 10 ish years later. And here uh, we are. We have yeah. a podcast. We're part of the online Zelda community. Lyndon. We've all come so far, man. It's been a wow. minute. Yes. Wow. Whew. Okay. Makes you feel a little old. Sometimes. Can you tell we want to play Majora's Mask? Like, really? I bad. really want to play Majora's Mask. I'm <laughs> so excited. I can't wait. That'd be such a fun one. There's so many things to talk about. Like, the, so the, many rabbit holes. The scheduling for that season is going to be interesting. Yeah, we're going to have to have oh, yeah. episodes devoted. That's why. That's why we need to do content. That's like you can take this part out, but that's why we need to do the poll now. Yeah, I know. Okay. Okay, anyway, you make good points. Anyway, cool. Uh, but know, regardless, yeah, do. Sam, you know what? We're going to look forward to catching up with you again sometime soon whenever we uh, move on to our next game, um, whether it be uh, Ocarina of Time Master Quest, Majora's Mask, or further in the future uh, when we start covering the Oracles back to back and then Tears of the Kingdom at the very end of our whole list of games, um, which is crazy that we've we've played through everything except those up until this point. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's wild, but uh, we and then we're gonna have to figure out what to do after that. Yeah, hopefully there will be another game. <laughs> Knock on wood. Uh, this is me knocking on wood, and also knowing it's going to be six more years until we get another. I know mainline Zelda game. Oh boy! Uh, but uh, you know what? Before we catch up with you again, would you like to remind everyone where they can follow you on uh, socials and all that stuff? Sure. I'm easy to find. I'm Nintendo fangirl on everything. Mostly I keep up on YouTube um, and I would say Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I'm pretty easy to follow. Awesome. And are you still I mean, are you still streaming like, you know, making content for your YouTube channel on a consistent basis or is it just kind of like whenever yeah, you're in the mood these days? You know, relatively consistent. Um, I mean, I had I had two videos in the past two weeks, past two weeks on YouTube, which is more than usual for me. I was on a little bit of a, a break, a content break for a while. Um, I was on a reality TV show last year. Um, Squid Game the Challenge, which was fun, but also really stressful. So I there's a while there where I was just like, you know, I'm not gonna upload anything. And so I didn't. Um, but now I'm kind of back to it, back to doing some stuff with Nintendo. So there's there's content. It's churning. Nice. What must it be like to have a break, Matt? You know, I don't know. We haven't had one of those in a while. In three years. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we take a week off here and there. Yeah, uh, yeah. When one of us is moving, that's not a break. That's fair. Moving is not a break. <laughs> we did take a week off when we went to Colorado. We oh, were, that's true. That we, was a break. That was a break. We were going to record up there with Jackson, but then <laughs> half of us spent half the time being sick. So we didn't end up doing that. Yeah. I never got sick, so it was a break for me. You didn't have as good a time. Man, I got such bad altitude sickness. That was It was rough. Mm, 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 mm. Colorado, beautiful state. Oh, I All love right. Colorado. Well, let's wrap it up and get out of here. Sam, thanks once again. We'll catch up with you soon. Thank you. All righty. Uh, if y'all enjoyed this episode and would like a little extra Sacred Realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash Sacred Realms pod and become a patron. If you've got no rupees, it is not a problem. Five star Apple podcast reviews are a great free way to support us. More reviews means that more people see our show and that makes us very happy. Hi, Leans. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Sacred Realms pod for updates on the podcast and for behind the scenes action. Sacred Realms will be back next Wednesday with the Spirit Tracks rank and recap. If you haven't finished playing Spirit Tracks yet, we would love for you to do that play along with us uh spirit tracks is unfortunately only playable in two places if you have a cartridge you can slot it into a ds or a 3ds and play it there Uh, if you were lucky enough to purchase it on the wii u virtual console before that service shut down then you can also play it there though most people say that that is not the way that you want to play this game um i don't know myself because i haven't tried but in the meantime may your hearts be full may your arrows never miss we'll catch you next
Sacred Realms is an independent, listener-supported podcast, which is produced, edited, and mixed by me, Lyndon Willoughby. Business operations are handled by Matt Willoughby. Our music is generously provided by Darknuck and is available to listen to on Spotify. Finally, we'd like to thank Nintendo for continuing to create such exceptional and innovative experiences. 